Hello, everybody. This is Bert Kreischer, and you're listening to my podcast. It's a good one today. By the way, I'm on tour. I don't know when this drops, but I am on tour. Just suffice to say, I've added tour dates well into 2022, and uh, and I am hitting everywhere. Go to BertBertBert.com. I'm sure Halston's throwing up my tour dates right now, and they're scrolling. But go to BertBertBert.com. Something smells in here. I think Mac pissed in here. Smells like piss? You just pissed. No, I smell piss where I'm sitting. I wouldn't be shocked if Mac... Fucking Mac, I smell piss in here. Did Either you, that or it might be my feet. Check to see if you piddled a little bit. Me? Yeah. No, I, you don't. You can't smell your own piss. <laughs> well, if it's strong, depends on what you've been eating this week. I have not. I have the worst fucking gut problem. I just had one of this Whitney's June Shine. We drink these on the podcast. Prickly pear margarita. It's actually really fucking good. I don't have much of a buzz from it. I smell piss, man. I, I wonder if it's my feet. Um it's this is whitney's check these out they're really enjoyable i drink them with my guest today amanda knox um amanda knox is uh, if you don't know she was on rogan by the way that's that's i'm sure she's like thank you for not bringing up the uh highly publicized murder accusations against me first and mentioning that you might have seen her on rogan you might have seen her on rogan you might have seen her on whitney oh yeah also there's a documentary on her on netflix i don't know what that's about look amanda knox is someone i followed um she was wrongfully accused of murder in Italy in, I think, 2007. Um, uh, and and she, I, I followed the case, oddly enough, and then I never thought I'd have the opportunity to talk to her. I hope it's an okay interview. You know I'm not the best at interviewing, so clearly I fucking, I, I should, probably shouldn't say that because now you guys are going to be like, I don't even want to listen. It's a good interview. We both cried at at some at one point. Um, we laughed, which I, I my big fear in this interview is that I was like, I'm not the fucking most serious guy in the world, and and we got very serious at times. Um, she told some really riveting stories about that I'd never heard her tell about her incarceration, about her freedom, about her acquittal, about her trial. Um, that and and I'm someone who's listened to a lot of Amanda Knox, oddly enough. But it's a great, great, great interview. I, I really thoroughly enjoyed it. And uh, and like I said, if you haven't heard her on any interviews, she's also on Whitney's podcast, and she was also on Joe's podcast. The podcast she did with Joe was fucking awesome. Really was awesome. And it is the reason I subscribed to her podcast called Labyrinths with her husband, Chris Robinson. Uh, check it out. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to listen to the one with um, Cheryl Hine. Cheryl Hine's from Tallahassee. And Cheryl Hines on there. And I think the podcast is mostly about when people feel lost and they don't feel like they're going to get out of being lost. But <clears throat> this was a great interview. It was a great interview and a very fascinating person to talk to and, and, and a very strong person. Leanne always talks about people having that Oprah gene and can you ad- get, get through adversity and come out on the other side. And this is a woman who has done exactly that. And she is bl- blossoming on the other side right now. And I'm very happy to see that. Uh, so I hope you enjoy the podcast, ladies and gentlemen. Without further ado, my friend—I guess I can call her my friend now. Yeah, we just spent two and a half hours together. My wife, my wife played with her baby. Yeah, my friend, Amanda Knox. You can do whatever you want. There's this podcast is not very formal. Have we started, Halston? Yes. Uh, we started already, <laughs> and this is how informal this podcast is. She's not on. Thank you. Camera. No, she's not on camera. Yeah, that's a that's a by the way, good call. Don't get your kids on camera. I fucked that up. Oh yeah. Oh my god. Oops. Well, see, I, I didn't I didn't know I was gonna get. Hey, uh, June Shine. Cheers to Whitney Cummings. Yay! This is what she sent a box of this. Is her new hard kombucha? It's gorgeous, just like Whitney. It uh, has a horse on it. Can I tell you what's crazy? Cheers. Cheers. Can I tell you what's crazy? Is I'm having stomach problems today. To like, like just bloating issues, and I think this is gonna fix it. Hmm. I love that taste, and I wouldn't have liked that taste as a kid. Well, Whitney says it tastes like her, so that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Boy, I've fantasized about that, Whitney. <laughs> Who hasn't? Um. Uh. That's great. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. I yeah. followed your, uh, I followed everything when in real time, 
when everything oh. started happening. Oh, when it was ugly. Yeah, and then I saw your documentary. You, Rogan, you were you were on Rogan, and I saw the documentary. I saw the documentary when it came out. 2016. Like, yeah, yeah, it came out in 2016. I was like, because I, I was like, wait, she's got a new documentary. I went to watch it. I was like, I've already seen this. <laughs> um, it's funny. I have a really bad sense of um, of retention of information. I'm not, I'm not really good. I think it was what makes me a good storyteller, but I'm not really good at like like little like facts of things. Okay. And so even like all I've known about that stuff, I still it it it's mind blowing to me that you were only in Italy for like two months before all this shit happened. Yeah, um, I was in Perugia for five or six weeks. By the way, wasn't aware that it was Perugia, and Perugia is between Florence and Rome. Yes. And I've driven through Perugia before. You have? I did. Uh, yeah, uh, driving from Florence, or from Rome to Florence. What time of year? I've traveled so much. I have, and this is, once again, I, I think it's, it's why I have a hard time with details. There's another thing. Okay, there, I should have written a list. Um, I have a hard time with details. Uh, I don't know. I really, I couldn't even tell you. I've been to Italy a lot. Okay, um, no worries. Do you still, how do you feel about Italy? Um, Complicated, right? Um, I mean, I definitely feel like I understand the culture a lot better now. Um, and that was one of my downfalls at the, at the beginning was not understanding um, gender dynamics there, not understanding, um, yeah, there was, there was so much I didn't understand about the culture. I had gone there when I was 14 with my family and I had gone and had the sort of romantic uh, under the Tuscan sun experience with my family where we just ate really good food and went to the Coliseum and did the touristy things. With, with your mom and stepfather? With my whole entire extended family. We all like really? got into vans and drove from Germany to um, Italy when I was 14 and did like a, a tour. And your and sisters, remember, your sisters were how old? My sisters. So I was 14. So Deanna was 12 or 13. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I remember I went through, like we went to Pompeii and I had studied Latin in middle school and I was walking around and I had learned about Pompeii. And so I felt like I was the tour guide in Pompeii. Anyway, it was like this beautiful, romantic, like touristy experience. And I thought, oh my gosh, I want to come back. I learned the language. Well, I didn't really learn the language, but I tried to learn language. Went back and um, had a very, very different experience as a young woman um, in the way that I was treated there. Um, but yeah. that isn't to say that it, um, it's not a great place that I don't want to, like, I want to go back and I really? have relationships with people. I've actually been back since everything. Um, did you know that? No, I did not. I knew, well, I knew you, I remember when you came over here. And by the way, my memory of things is always shady, but mm -hmm. I remember when you came over here. And you were still found guilty, and then and and they were trying to extradite you. I do remember following that, mm. and then you were found innocent. And I was, and I remember there was a time where they were like, they needed you to go back. You're like, there's no way I'm fucking going back. <laughs> yeah, like, people, <clears throat> people said it was a. I was in prison for four years, but there was that four years of, but you know, potentially facing extradition. That was a really, really difficult time for me as well. Um, because I couldn't really exist in the world as a normal person. I, I wanted to plant roots. I wanted to go to school. I wanted to do the, get a job, do the things that people do. Um, but I was also having to have meetings with lawyers and talk to them about potentially turning myself in here in the U S and hoping that they would let me serve my sentence here. If I had to serve a sentence, okay, and so, uh, uh, the thing that, the thing that, um, the reason I connected with it, me and you have a very similar thing. And I, I someone had said this on somewhere, but I am the person that if I got charged with a murder, I would behave in a way mm. that would make me look very guilty to anyone. I, I, I've always felt guilty when I didn't do anything. Mm. I, I This is going to sound crazy, but like I, my buddy Blair uh, had had 300 bucks in his um, in his uh, cab, cab, like sock drawer when we were in college. And he came out and he was like, hey, man you haven't gone through my sock drawer at all, have you? And I was like, no. I was like, why? And he's like, well, it's, I'm missing $300. And I was like, okay. And he wasn't, he, by the way, he wasn't even really accusing me of it. Right, right. He was, he was asking. Yeah, like, just, oh, hey, by the way, have yeah. you been through my sock drawer? Although that's a very specific ask. I, it's a very specific <laughs> ask. I behaved guilty. What did you do? How, I define just, behave guilty. But, but I just, I behaved guilty. Like, I, I remember, like, I remember, like, 
just going like, I wonder, like, I wonder where a sock drawer is. Like, I don't even know where a sock drawer is. And like okay. looking in his room one day and he's like, what are you doing? And I was like, I was just looking for a sock drawer. I mean, it's just like. I, returning I just, to the scene yeah, of the yeah. crime, of course. <laughs> I mean, just, like I, when, when all this happened to you, I went, I immediately, I was like, I don't believe, I don't, I didn't believe in sex games gone wrong. I didn't believe that. I looked at you and I was like, I'm, I can pretty much assess people pretty easily. Okay. And I was like, and I was like, that's not, that chick doesn't party like that. That's not what that <laughs> chick looks like. And, okay. and, and I was, and, it, and by the way, I was also, I'd gone through that time in my life. I knew that there are certain things they say where you go, hold on, that doesn't, doesn't rub me right. I'll give you another example. And this is horrible that, uh, that these are the two things, but the Duke rape case. Oh yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I, when they said that those guys raped her, I went, that it didn't happen. And I, and I told Leanne, I said, I was in a fraternity and we had strippers come over and the pirate power dynamic is very different than what they're suggesting interesting the, uh, the power dynamic always is the stripper is control in control mm. and there are too many guys there are way too many guys with level heads i'm not saying that women don't get raped at these things that's sure, what i'm but saying they get ushered off into little but, rooms where no one else is watching yeah uh, there's a, po a power dynamic that and shady shit happens but when i saw that i said that didn't happen and i just i just know that doesn't didn't happen leanne's like well it seems like they're guilty I go, I don't know. It just doesn't seem like it would be me. And the same mm. thing happened with you. When I saw that come down, and I was just like, I was like, no, man, chicks don't kill their friends. They just don't. That doesn't have, it's not real. And no guy can convince you. There's no sex game. I just, it, everything seemed off for me. Yeah. And so, um, but, but I have that, that like, as, as you, I'm sure you must have looked back and said, it was innocent i didn't mean i was just i was in the arms of the guy i was dating i was nervous i was scared and then yeah. you see that picture and you're like what I, I, that shouldn't incriminate me yeah and i like some of the it's interesting i remember malcolm gladwell wrote in his book that's, about yeah. how that's where I, I heard i heard it that's yeah, where i heard it that's where you heard it so he brought up this interesting point which is that you know maybe there are some people in the world who have the sort of bad habit of acting guilty even when they're innocent. And he also made the point that there are some people out there who are amazing con men because they're guilty people who totally act innocent and no one would ever think of them. Yeah. I did actually talk to Malcolm Gladwell after his, like after he wrote his chapter and I was like, so I don't totally agree with your, with what you have to say. And the, and the reason is this, that the, the idea that he sort of presented was that there's a certain kind of person who can be wrongly convicted. And that per kind of person is an innocent person who acts guilty. And the fact of the matter is that anyone can be wrongly convicted. You don't have to be yeah. a kind of person who acts guilty. And especially when you consider that, like, if a, if a detective or if a prosecutor has tunnel vision, what that means is they have motivated reasoning in what they're seeing. So they're going to only notice things in a guilty light. It's like, you know, seeing something through rosy glasses because you're in love. Everything looks beautiful. Everything mm -hmm. is wonderful that that person does. Well, it's the same thing with prosecutors or detectives who have just decided, like, I have a gut feeling about you. And now everything that you do to me looks guilty, no matter what it is that you're doing. So you cry. It's because you're crocodile tears. If you don't cry, it's because you have no emotions whatsoever. And so I think that's like the um, a sort of key thing that when we think about wrongful convictions, it's important to like think well, sure, they say that they're acting weird, but first of all, who am I to to put myself in? Like, I'm not actually putting myself in their shoes. Yeah. And two, what does acting guilty even mean? What does it mean? And and did like, at what point at what point did you start thinking to yourself? At what point do you think things went wrong for you? Uh, um. Could there have been, in hindsight, could there have been a different way to call 911? Well, I didn't know how to call 911 in Italy. It's not 911, yeah. right? So I had to go get my boyfriend, Raffaele, at the time to help me deal with that. Um, I think, I mean, I feel like I didn't really have a chance at all, really, from the get-go. Um I think maybe as soon as the um, the TV cameras started rolling, 
um, which was immediately basically like we were out. We were still outside of our house, like a new crime scene. And there were already cameras across the street rolling. And I feel like that was when the police felt like they were under pressure to perform. And when they decided that they needed to find a guilty party immediately. Really? And from that point on, that meant that they were no longer searching just based on evidence. They were searching based on gut feelings. And like ultimately what happened is the evidence did eventually lead them to the real killer. Someone who did act guilty by running away. Like this literally was, ran away. Like, this was the guy, Rudy? Yeah, Rudy Gaudet. So Rudy, this is another thing I, I don't think I ever really wrapped my head around. Rudy? You guys met Rudy. L let me start from the beginning. So, because mm -hmm. Rudy had come down to your and like hung out at your house a couple times, right? So, Rudy Gaudet was a, a local. Um, he played basketball, like did sort of pick up basketball with um, in the local like basketball court that was in front of the university. And that was really nearby my house. So, the guys that lived in the apartment downstairs from us often would play basketball with him, like pickup games. And those were like two law students, right? So no, those, so the two law students that you're thinking of are the other two roommates that I had besides Meredith. Those okay. are two Italian women. Oh, okay. I thought those were dudes. I must've no. clumped them in. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So we lived on the top floor of a house and then the bottom floor, there lived four guys and they were all just doing their thing. Um, it was a separate apartment situation, but we would occasionally go out to dinner together or like go out to a club together. Like it just, you know, household dynamics, but they would go and play basketball, have pickup games with whoever was there, including Rudy Gaudet. And occasionally those people would come over to their house. And one time Rudy Gaudet came to their house and they invited us downstairs. And that's when we met Rudy Gaudet. And Rudy, kind of, if I'm not mistaken, he had a crush on you. That's what they say. I don't I didn't know that. Apparently, after we went and like hung out with them for a few minutes, they were they sort of after a while, me and Meredith just went back upstairs. It was time to go to bed. And afterwards, it was when they were sort of talking about us. And Giacomo, one of the guys downstairs, had a crush on Meredith. So I'm sure that they brought that up. And then maybe Rudy Gaudet said something about me. That's at least what those said when I was on trial. But no one ever told me that. I didn't even actually know his name until I was already arrested. Really? Yeah. And and and. You and and you, but you you got there in like September, right? October, September. So I got to Europe in September, and then I spent time with my family in um, Germany, and then I went. Do down. you have family? Family in Germany? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm actually going to be going to Germany in a few weeks to visit my aunt. Really? Mm -hmm. I love Germany. Yeah, I love. Have Germany. you been there for Oktoberfest? Well, I love no. So my fiftieth is next year, and my wife said um, we want to do something big, and our our best friend. Um, her is turning 50 a week before me and mm -hmm. she wants to do she wants to ride bikes through the swiss alps Ooh. and Ooh. so yeah well you yeah. apparently you know it's I, so funny i'd talk to um i talked to uh kate hudson and oliver hudson uh their sons and daughters of uh goldie hawn and kurt russell oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I, I said what what's one of the funnest things you guys ever did as kids and they were like mountain uh biking through the Swiss Alps. Cool. They're like, it was the funnest thing. You'd go, you'd mountain bike, you'd go have sit down, drink, eat lunch, and then you'd mountain bike for another hour and then go have dinner, eat and drink. And so I was like thinking of that. And then I was like, well, if I want to tag my trip onto that, I would kind of take the girls to Germany. And my daughter, Georgia, this is, it's interesting. We were talking about you have your, your, your newborn here. Um, my daughter, Georgia wants to go to Italy. Yeah. And, and she, so we're taking. Like study abroad or just visit? Just, she wants, for graduation, she wanted me, mm. her, and her sister and her mom to go to Italy for oh, like a bad. long time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I started thinking to myself, you know, it's crazy the vulnerability that happens when you have a child, mm. when, when you don't want them to, to fail ever. You don't want them to have hardships. You clearly don't want them to be wrongfully accused for a murder and spend. Uh, what was it 10 years fighting for the to get eight years, eight years yeah, for total. innocence you also don't want them to be murdered you don't want them to be murdered but you but there is certain things that i'm sure you must see that your life has changed in a way that you that you you those hardships make you a better person mm. me not getting 
you know, Georgia's applying to colleges. And I I, was, I really wanted her to, it's very clear where I wanted her to go. And so. <laughs> <laughs> wink, wink. <laughs> I, I, re, I, I took her there. And then you were like, oh, you're afraid. What if she doesn't get in? But that not getting into college makes you a better person. Mm. You you need to fail. You need to have hardships. And, and it sucks to watch them have hardships. It sucks so much because. It, it it just bumped me out and you're at the very beginning of this road and and i'm so curious like I, w- I was wondering what's what's one thing about old amanda that you that is kind of dead that you go i that mm. that didn't make it through the like old amanda when in high school she like like that didn't make it through the prison stint yeah no that's a really good question um what didn't make it? One of the things I found interesting is that you said you had you'd only had sex with you could count the number of partners on one hand. By the way, I can go two hands, but I'm real close to one hand. <laughs> and so, but up until I lost my virginity, I was going to be very sexually active. Like I was on a path to be like, I'm just gonna bag as many chicks as possible. And then that first experience was so vulnerable for me mm. and so imprinting of like who I genuinely was that I, that it, it changed me forever. And I, I, the next girl I dated, which was a long time girlfriend, I didn't have sex with. I didn't have sex with because I didn't, I just was like, I, I don't, I'm not ready to do it again. And it, I mean, very few boys go, the, I'm not ready to do it again. Yeah. And, and I've only been with a grand total of like six women because because of that first time experience. Can I ask, um, is that too much to pry into that? Cause I'm actually really curious about that. I like, was it, was it, was someone that you were in love with? Was uh, it was someone, I don't even know if she knows it's her, but uh, it was someone that I was, that was like out of my league. I thought it was out of my league. Um, and I would say I was in love with, I, I don't know if I knew I wasn't in love with, but I was, definitely um very 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 attracted to i mean she was like I, if i remember correctly i think she was like in the homecoming queen or something like okay she was a year older than me too okay and, interesting and um and it it was it was a it was a mess it was a mess it was not it did not go off the way i thought it was going to go off okay i was very i was very clumsy i did nothing and it and and then the, what really affected me was the day after, and then the, the preceding month after, was being afraid if she got pregnant or being afraid that I got AIDS. Really? Yeah. And okay. So it wasn't like you had this deep emotional connection. It was just not this sort of I'm a go getter, like I know what I'm doing kind of experience. I thought and it therefore was, I thought it could be very uh very franchisey, like you know, go in uh you do it with this person that was really cool i'm gonna go on to the next person but what i realized is i I only want to do this with people that i absolutely love and i want and i trust Mm. and i don't and i don't like i I need to be like this is us yeah i mean i mean i remember the like three days after i lost my virginity maybe maybe a week I was gonna go to dinner with her. I really hope she never hears this. Um, I, I we don't to have dinner. to talk no, about it. Either. I, I'm an open book. I, that's my 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 flaw, but it's a good flaw to have. I don't mind telling telling the truth about things. Yeah. Um. I. Uh. Her her family went to take me to dinner, and they came. She came to the door to get me, and I ran to the bathroom and started throwing up violently. I was having, I was like, I just, I, to this day, can't. but was this like all in your it's own head, head and own like, head. she was perfectly nice she was to you and everything. Awesome. Mm. She was awesome. I just was like, I was like, I was a mess. I was a mess. But huh. one of this, one of the things I, when I'm, when, you know, I followed your story, when I heard your story is that they painted you as this sex team and you're like, I wasn't, I had, no. had but you, but you were at a point where you were like, Hey, I'm gonna sew my oats while I'm here. I'm gonna make up. I'm gonna have a couple boyfriends. I'm gonna have fun. Yeah. And I was like, I bet. I was like, that's gone. I bet that's gone. Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> that's fair. Yeah. <laughs> that's gone. That There's no. You didn't come like, back to Seattle. Like, all right, I'm back in the saddle. Who wants it? <laughs> yeah. No. Not at all. Um. Yeah. No. That is actually a very true. I. I think that when I went there, 
I had this feeling like even even more so than going to college for the first time, I was like, I am on my own. I am an independent woman and I am taking care of myself and doing my independent woman thing. Mary Tyler Moore syndrome. Yeah. And um, it didn't work out. <laughs> Um, and I didn't know like that's that's one of the things that maybe would have turned it around is if I had known to ask for help. I didn't know that I could or should ask for help. I didn't know that I needed help um, in those first few days after, you know, we discovered that my roommate had been murdered and prior to my arrest, like there were four days there where I was being interrogated for hours and hours and hours and hours. And I was being told that it was because I was an important witness, that I was close to Meredith, that I lived in the house, I had discovered the crime scene. So I had to be there at the beck and call of the police for hours and hours and hours on end, ask, answering their like same questions over and over and over again. And I had this feeling of like, I feel like they're mad at me or am I just like, is my language not good enough? And that's why they keep asking me the same questions over again. What's going on here? And I remember my aunt, who's in Germany, um, was like, maybe you should talk to the American embassy. And my mom was calling me and was like, maybe I should come over there and help you. Um, and I kept thinking, but, you know, I'm I'm OK. I'm hanging out with Raffaele. He's letting me stay at his apartment until we figure everything out. I I feel like I I. I'm not like a little kid anymore. I, I can find my a new apartment and, and everything. And it did not occur to me that I was actually like strapped to the train tracks and I was just looking the other direction while the train was about to hit me. And I just didn't know. And other people around, like even people who were thousands of miles away were like, something's not right. And indeed the day my mom arrived in Italy was the day they arrested me. Everyone knows about my weight loss journey. Sometimes you feel trapped and you don't know which are good foods or which are bad foods, and it just creates unnecessary dilemmas. Noom is here to change how we see food with a psychology-based approach that looks at what you eat, but also how you eat. Instead of making you feel guilty or regret, Noom empowers you to keep going. Ron's chick is our bus driver, Ron. His chick lost 50 fucking pounds on Noom. He swears by it. When we we were betting Nadav a million dollars that he couldn't lose 75 pounds, and, and Ron was like, I got his answer. It's Noom. This is what's great. You don't, need, you don't need rules to lose weight. You just need the knowledge and wisdom to empower you to build smarter, more sustainable habits. That is exactly what I'm doing right now. Noom's cognitive behavioral approach helps you better understand your relationship with food and how to be more mindful of your habits. It gives you the knowledge to support and support you need for long-lasting change. 75% of Noom users finished the program and more than 60% of the users engaged with the program keep the weight off for a year or more. All you need is 10 minutes a day, a daily check-in, no gruelly early mornings or huge chunks out of your day. And if you don't worry, if you fall off track, Noom will help get you back on track. Start building better habits for healthier, long-term results. Sign up for your trial at Noom.com slash BirdCast. That's N O O M dot com slash Burtcast. Are you thinking about a gift you can get the whole family? Maybe a gift for the fitness lover in your life? Maybe you have a wife who gets out aggression sometimes and you think this might be a perfect gift. This would be a perfect fucking gift for Leanne. The holidays are coming up. We know it's the most stressful time of year, and the perfect gift is right around the corner Fight Camp. It brings the best workouts in the world into your home and makes it fun. Learn to box, kickbox from home with access to world-class programming, elite trainers, premium equipment, and smart technology that turns your workout into an interactive experience. I'm telling you, man, you find a way to make working out fun and, and distracting, and then you can work out all the time. Talk about distracting. They have a thousand, thousands of classes, and these are quick workouts. You can do them in as little as 20 minutes or less. If you have no boxing experience, Fight Camp has your back. They've created programs specifically designed to teach you the basics of boxing and kickboxing so you can build a strong foundation. And what's awesome, they provide real-time data during your workout so you can track your progress and work toward goals, see exactly how you're improving over time. It's a full-body workout and a brain workout because boxing requires focus. 
precise combinations, push you to think about the punches you throw. When I watch those guys in um, uh, do those combinations, it's overwhelming. So I had to do them with the movie, and you really use your brain, and it's great for the whole family. You can get the whole family involved. Fight Camp is one of the only home workouts that's safe for kids to do because there are no heavy weights, no spinning wheels, and it's an amazing way for them to get their energy out. Right now is the best time to get your Fight Camp. Take advantage of their holiday pricing going on now to save over $200 on a Fight Camp package. If you purchase this month, you'll get an additional pair of gloves valued at $149 for free. The deal is going on now, but it ends soon. Just go to joinfightcamp.com slash Bert to get a free additional pair of gloves for free and save $200. Go to joinfightcamp.com slash Bert. That's joinfightcamp.com slash Bert. How soon until the murder till you reached out to your parents? Did you call them that day and be like, oh, something bad happened? Well, I did call my mom before I even knew something bad had happened. Like I called my mom. So what I what happened that morning, the morning of November 2nd, actually, today is oh the my God. Uh, anniversary of her death. Um, I came home to take a shower and get changed into new clothes so I could go off for a weekend with Raffaele to this town called Gubbio. Um, and I came home and found the door wide open, which was odd and no one home. And so I like sort of called out, like, is anyone home? Okay. No one locked the door behind me, took a shower, but then noticed things were off. There was like poop left in the other toilet. There was, it was just, things were off. And so I went back to Raffaele's house and I told him that. And then we, when we came back together, I called my mom and I was like, mom, I don't really know what's up. Like, I have a weird feeling that something's wrong, but I don't know what it is. And she was just like, talk to Raphael. I talk to your roommates, like figure out what's going on. I called her in the middle of the night. I didn't even think about it. Um, but yeah, my first thought was talk to my mom, talk to Raphael and talk to my mom. Um, because my roommates weren't answering their cell phones. So Jesus. Now, what about your other two roommates, the law students, did they get, did, did they get interrogated? They got questioned, but not as much as me. And they were law students and they spoke the language. Yes. And do you think did they did they point to you and go, did mm-hmm. they stand up for you or? So they did not point to me. Um, I mean, even the day I was arrested, like right before that, I was interrogated. Philomena, one of my roommates, called me up and was talking to me about getting another apartment together. So like we were all on, on good terms trying to figure out the situation together up until I was arrested. And then once I was arrested, they did not stand up for me. So um, this is actually something that um, is being studied by some students in New York at John Jay University. Uh, There's a student who's calling it the Philomena effect after my roommate, which is that someone who you trust and you're you're on good terms with, as soon as they're accused, suddenly you change your opinion about them. So everything you say up to that point is like, oh, yeah, they're totally cool, not suspicious at all. And then they get accused and then they change their perspective, which if you make if you think about it, actually kind of makes a lot of sense. Like, oh, you're hanging out with people. Everything's totally fine. And then someone tells you, oh, that person raped someone. You're like, oh, maybe I have a whole new perspective of who that person is, even though. I never would have thought about that about that person before Mm -hmm. and say that then that rape accusation is wrong. And then you're like, oh, shit. Now I just thought all these horrible things about somebody who totally didn't deserve it. And also, I never thought about that about that person before anyway. Anyway, so it's yeah, though, it's very common in cancel culture. Yes. Is you don't know you you hear something horrible about someone, uh, you know, a rape accusation. Mm -hmm. It's happened a number of times in the comedy circles Mm -hmm. and you just see. How many people just start flocking away and just going, just distancing themselves? Yeah. And then, and then, you know, it's what's interesting is that I think cancel culture piles on and people start uh, getting mad if you don't reach out to them. And if you do reach out to them, people get mad. And so it's, it's just a weird fucking time, but that. Yeah. And cancel culture is really bad because it's not like the criminal justice system where there are rules. Yeah. There's no rules. There's no rules. There's no like there's no way to determine what counts as evidence or not. It's all just sort of based on feeling and how one acts in the aftermath of being accused, which is really interesting. Oh, if my wife disappears 
I'm just going to say I killed her because <laughs> I'm, I'm going to behave so much like I killed her. <laughs> I'll be like, I, 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 if Leanne goes missing, I'm just going to. You're like, like digging a grave I just in the did backyard. It, guys. I did it. And they're I, like, what are yeah. you doing? I was like, you, you want me to have done it. You, I know you want me to have done it. I'll let you just, I'll just kill me. No. Oh, I, I, I definitely, I, uh, yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't do what you did. I think about that a lot. I couldn't do what you did. I couldn't, what do you la- mean? I couldn't, I wouldn't be where you are today had that been me. Well, you don't know that. No, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure. I got accidentally locked into a cell in Alcatraz <laughs> and I had a panic <laughs> oh attack. God. I got uh, accidentally locked. I would have a panic attack as well. <laughs> I do not do well with being enclosed in spaces. I, oh, I mean, God. I don't like elevators. I, I don't like handcuffs. Mm. I don't like, I, I, I have a real problem with uh, wrongful accusations. I, it, it sends me when you can't stand up for yourself and someone accuses you of something and you can't stand up for yourself and you just watch it spread like wildfire because it, and it just sends me through the roof. And I, and I, I just, I've just learned to never to look at anything, you know, like, like I remember one, one time, one guy, this is like fucking probably 15 years ago. No, probably 10 years ago. He was like, you're just an alcoholic that gets on stage and tells the same stories over and over again. And by the way, I don't, right? I don't. Like, I've, obviously, I have four fucking specials. I'm, I Clearly, I, I write. He's referring to the fact that I tell the machine story, which is fascinating that I... I have to admit that I don't know any of these stories. Oh, well, well. <laughs> I am, I am, imagine... <laughs> I don't know the right way to say this. I am famous for all like almost the same path you took, except I got away with it. If that makes sense, I didn't murder anybody, but I robbed a train. You and, did? Yeah, yeah. What? Yeah. So who I, robs a train today? <laughs> like, what are you, you talking you about? You traveled abroad. You know how crazy things can get. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was when I was in college. I went to. Um, Russia to study abroad. Okay. And at the time, the Russian mafia ran everything. Okay. And uh, and I became friends with and them. And so you thought, oh, I'll just. Well, I became friends with them, and they were cool in St. Petersburg. They were very light and very user friendly in St. Petersburg. Just partied, okay. stories, go to a club, and then. How did you know they were mafia, not just a fun times club? Because they were. Um, because the way that our the way that um the russia ran back then is that in order to stay safe you had to pay off the mafia ah so, so these are like some guys who like would very, be like here i want some of your money and you'd be like okay and then they were like all right cool let's go drink no so the bigger organization oh. would be like hey amen if you want to stay safe and you don't want people robbing you left and right because you guys are a group of americans right you need someone to just be around so if something happens they can be like hey nope and say ah. the right words and so obviously, and I mean this very respectfully, I hope to God they're not listening, but they were very low level, entry level dudes that were not scary fucking guys. They were very, I, I would argue, very sweet dudes. Uh, and I never saw them do anything horrific. My guys. Right. And in the movies, they would just be the ones that would get capped immediately and you'd never heard their story. Yeah, yeah. probably. And then and then we went and we took a train and a different mafia ran the train and a different mafia ran Moscow. And uh I met I I got two new gangsters on the train and they were a little different, less user friendly, a little more aggressive. And we ended up drinking, getting pretty drunk, and then robbing the train. And then and then Wait. and then when we got to Moscow. The you cops like were skipped there. over the robbing the train part. Yeah. Well, How do you right now, right now, train? every one of my listeners goes, <laughs> Did Bert Kreiser bring Amanda Knotts on his podcast to tell her the machine story? <laughs> They're losing their fucking mind. They're like, what's next? What's next? You gonna bring up fucking Van Wilder? <laughs> I like this story without jokes in it. Yeah, and so, uh, so we get to Moscow, and 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 uh, the police are there, and they're my, interrogating my class. It's been robbed, and my teachers, and you know, everyone's upset. And I get off the train, and the cop comes up to me, and he's like, uh, "So I understand you're the machine." It was my nickname. And I was like, yeah. And he's like, tonight you party with us. And I was like, all right. And so it's like, I think it's why I was intrigued by your story okay. initially because I got in trouble studying abroad and I got away with it and it gave me a career. And so I told my okay. story just like you did on Joe Rogan probably 10 years ago. And, mm. it, and it 
became viral and wow and i started and it started now it's a story i tell every time when i go on stage i tell it at the end of the show okay and so it's it's very fascinating to see because i i often think I, there was a very very real i mean i and i know this story is bigger than what i'm it was a real experience in my life i mean that sounds potentially very scary and and i remember distinctly um the the feeling of panic and i this is i would never talk about this on stage i don't think it serves a story but the genuine fe- feeling of panic that i got walking off the train the cop called me over and walking to the cop and going oh I, i've really fucked up like i've really fucked Oof. up and um and i did it by the way i did the thing mm-hmm. uh and and as i got closer to the cop i just remember him he was he wasn't as upset as i thought he was and he was talking to the gangster and he was a little lighter and i got up to him and he just looked at me and he goes so i understand you're the machine and i was like oh my god i'm not in trouble and he's like no you're not in trouble fuck that bitch this is russia and i was like wow okay and then it was like oh my god like what the fuck just happened it was really a whirlwind it was one of the drunkest i've ever been in my life also but um but i remember hearing thinking i remember identifying when you're hearing your story i remember identifying with being being abroad mm. and and uh and that feeling uh, the feeling when i thought i was getting arrested in russia i remember i was thinking i don't i'm not ready for the gulag that's all i kept thinking yeah no i i've heard horror stories about russian prisons from prisoners um in italy who are russian um but what's i think what's interesting for me is that it took me a long time to realize how fucked I was. Like it was not even clear to me when I was being arrested that I was fucked. Really? Yeah. Because like they didn't tell me that I was being arrested for murder. They like put handcuffs on me and like stripped me naked and took photos of my body and all of that. They did all of that. But telling me that it was, again, because I was a witness and they were taking me somewhere for my own protection and that I would get to see my mom and like all of this bullshit. And they took me to prison and then I just sat in a cell for a while and I didn't know that I was even accused of murder until I was brought before a judge. And a judge then said, you are, you know, you're being investigated for the murder of Meredith Kircher. How do you plea? And that was like the first that I knew, understood what was happening. And even then it like took a really, really long time for me to like realize, no, this isn't just like a terrible misunderstanding. Like this is, this is real. Um, And I, I, you know, it took me two years, right? Like I didn't really, really fully realize how fucked I was until I was actually wrongly convicted until I got the guilty verdict. Because those two years leading up to that, I just kept thinking, there's no way. There's, there's no, no way. way. There's that, I, that's what I kept thinking. For you, I kept going, why doesn't someone just go over there and tell them they're wrong? Like, I, I, I kept thinking that. Like, who's supposed to be the adult in the room here? Like, what is going on? Um, and yeah, I kept thinking that there was all just a big misunderstanding and they would figure it out. Like, they, they, the evidence would come back and they would figure it out. And then evidence kept coming forward that they either made up or was out of completely out of nowhere um, that would eventually get, you know, taken down by independent experts who would be like, no, that's bullshit. But like, in the meantime, I'm hearing things like, oh, your, your DNA and Meredith's DNA is on a knife. And I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, that's impossible. Like, what are you talking about? And they were just like, that's just the way it is. And so I'm sitting there going, I'm, I'm in, I'm Alice in Wonderland right now. And there's nothing I can do about it. Meanwhile, I'm like in a cell and everyone's talking about me, but like in the news and the media, blah, blah, blah. And I can't say anything. It didn't help that you were so fucking photogenic. That's what they say. I don't think that I'm particularly photogenic. Amanda, I'm sure there's people that have been wrongfully <laughs> accused that I was not interested in. Like, uh, clearly, I was interested in you because I found you attractive. I saw that picture and I went, who is that? Mm. That's, I mean, that's the, I mean, that it's, it, it stinks because I literally said, I was like, she is beautiful. And then I was like, wait, what the fuck? And then and then I was like, there's no, there's no way. And and at what point in your incarceration did they find Rudy guilty of doing this? Right. So one can I take off my shoes, you by the way? Do whatever you want. Thank you. I just wanted to get like a little more cozy on the seat. Yeah, I'm a I'm a I'm a big uh, crisscross applesauce guy. By the way, <laughs> I've been saying crisscross applesauce since I had kids. The other night I was on a, in, in an on an Indian reservation telling jokes. 
And I just naturally said, sitting crisscross applesauce, and everyone laughed. And I went, the alternative is saying something very offensive on a fucking India reservation. <laughs> so I'm so glad that my, like, when you talk about progress, that my kids got me to start saying crisscross applesauce. Did you ask them how they would say it? Who? At the Indian reservation. No, I wasn't going to roll the dice on that. <laughs> <laughs> I think they just call it sitting. Okay. Oh, fair enough. <laughs> um, so... Rudy Gaudet um, was discovered. They found his fingerprints in her blood, by the way, at the crime scene after they had arrested me already. Um, and so they ran his prints. They found him. He's, he's a guy who had already been in the system. He had been arrested before for having done exactly the same thing, broken and entered into people's homes, um, even wielding a knife. He has never had raped and murdered anyone yet. Um, they, so they found out who he was. They found out that he had skipped town, that he had skipped the country actually. And then they got a friend of his to sort of get on Skype with him at the time to like talk to him and figure out where he was. And then once they found out where he was, they had the German police go and arrest him and extradite him back to Italy. So they found him actually very, very soon. Like if you think about it, two weeks isn't isn't a long time to go with not knowing like they caught the murderer in two weeks. That's a really good job, except they had already accidentally or not accidentally arrested other people too. And so you and Raffaella, Raffaella and my boss, Patrick, the Mumba and see a black dude. mm -hmm, Yes. And when they found basically Patrick, the Mumba had an alibi from the get go, like multiple people had said that he was with them that entire night, but they arrested him anyway, even though I recanted and kept him in prison until they were able to get Rudy Gaudet and they just sort of swapped them out. So Patrick, the Mumba was allowed to be free. Rudy Gaudet was put into prison and then he was being investigated alongside Raphael and me. And then in Italy, what they do is they have a sort of, I guess it's their version of a grand jury trial where it's not like a trial trial with like, you know, a jury and, um, and you know, witnesses and, and all of that. It's just like a judge who hears what the prosecution, what evidence they have before them. And then you can decide if you want to do a fast track trial to either get a verdict then or you can decide, OK, the judge is going to say whether or not this merits going to trial. And so what me and Raffaele did, we did not want to forego an actual trial, which would allow us to bring experts in and to hear witnesses and all of that. Yeah. We, we absolutely wanted that. Rudy Gaudet's attorneys, however, knew that he there was so much evidence against him that there was no point in going to a big jury trial. And the the thing that you the benefit that you get from doing a fast track trial by just being judged right then and there is you get a third of your sentence cut off. So, so basically, it's, it's basically a guilty plea. It's basically a guilty plea. So he did the guilty plea equivalent in Italy while maintaining his innocence, was found guilty, sentenced to 30 years. And we, Raffaele and me, were sent on to be tried in a big trial. Well, now, when you say recant, you, did you give them a false confession? I gave them, I signed false statements um, that they wrote for me. Um, I was... So it was never you saying... This is what happened. It was that they wrote it down and you just signed it. It was, it's complicated. The way that it happened was, again, I was being interrogated for hours and hours and hours. Um, They brought me in that final night. It was in the middle of the night. And they told me that everything that I knew was wrong. Everything that I was saying to them was wrong, that I had actually witnessed something horrible and that I just didn't remember it because of how traumatic it was. And if I didn't remember what they told, what they wanted me to remember, then I was going to never see my family again. And so here I am thinking, I must be crazy. Like, why are these people yelling at me? Why are they hitting me? Why are they telling me I'm never going to see my family again? They must be right. I must have witnessed something and now I don't remember. So it. they weren't, uh, and this, I apologize. If this is something you've said before, but they weren't like good copying you they were just good cop bad copying you there like was, they were being they were being aggressive to you yes the vast majority of them were being aggressive to me there was one cop who was telling me hey just so you know like i've been in a car accident before and i forgot everything i have no memories of being in the car accident this is probably exactly like the car accident you probably just witnessed something so horrible that you don't even remember it and it's not your fault 
Meanwhile, everyone else is telling me that I'm a fucking liar and they're screaming at me. So what ended up happening is they what found- a fucking, what, a, what a shit language to be yelled at into because Italian is such a fucking passionate language. Yeah, it, it, everything like rhymes. Yeah, everything fucking <laughs> just, yeah. good God. Um, anyway, they found a text message between me and my boss, Patrick Lumumba, that said, like, we had exchanged text messages the night that the murder happened. And so they were like, oh, look, you and you were making an appointment to meet with your boss so that he could rape and murder Meredith. That was, and so that's how that all came about. Um, and yeah. And what's really frustrating is that all of my interrogations up to that point had been recorded. But then very, very conveniently, that one interrogation was not recorded. And so it's my word against them what happened. But meanwhile, they they got what they wanted. That is, uh, it is so fucking colossally frustrating. You know who it sucks the most for in all of this is like, is Meredith's parents. Yes. That, like I, I agree. I, when I first started following this, I empathized very closely with you. When I listened to Rogan... And I listen, you were great on Rogan, by the way. You were fantastic oh. on Joe. It was just such a great interview. Well, he was just so um, nice. He too. Joe's the fucking greatest. He really is the greatest. I, I you know. Uh but I as a, I very quickly as a parent f- started kind of feeling for Meredith's family yeah. and going, Yeah, but there's like there's a person that was lost. And it sounds like a fun person. Yeah. Like, I, I mean, it's I I know you guys hung out for only for like two months, but it seems like you guys, you know. Yeah, no, she was really, really nice. She was a very nice person, very smart. Um, like she had her quiet moments when she would just go read on this, those steps, but also she would love to go get pizza and we would go and go grocery shopping together, went dancing together. Like she was a really nice person. And you're right. Like the Italian justice system had a duty to her parents most of all. And they just made what should have been a very simple and straightforward case into an overly complicated mess, so that they never feel like they can ever have closure. Well, then, yeah, never. I don't. I don't feel like. I don't even feel like. And I. I know a great deal about this trial. I don't even feel like there's closure. I feel like the fact that that Rudy guy just kind of got in, got out, and and was like, you know. And he's out of prison now. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's already out of prison. Um, have you spoken to her family at all? I have not spoken directly to them. I've I've attempted at various times to send them a message conveying that my desire to talk to them, but I have not pushed on the issue because I understand how complicated it is. Um, I, at the very least, know that um, her dad very much felt that I was guilty um, and that they didn't appreciate the fact that my family pushed so hard to change the the tide that was happening in the media so like in the very like in the first months of my arrest like i was slaughtered in the media i was just the biggest drug addled horrible horror monster of a person and my family was told by our lawyers like don't say anything in the media we need to keep this to the courtroom blah 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 and eventually my family was like we can't take this anymore the things that they're saying about amanda are all wrong we need to counter this narrative that's like the court of the public opinion is slaughtering her they're not yeah. just making her guilty they're slaughtering her we need to stand up for her so they started standing up for me in a big way and that changed what was at that point a less complicated narrative just evil woman a like slammed yeah. up narrative yeah and that was something that I, I know frustrated the Kircher family because they felt like in the process of my family defending me, the focus of the trial was shifting away from their daughter and onto me. And, and in a way that is true, but in another way, it's like the sort of blame was put onto me, like how dare, you know, Amanda defend herself basically. But what was actually the problem was that the prosecution and the media had decided to focus on me in the first place. And I never should have been focused upon. Mm-hmm. Like I was, I had nothing to do with this. And the they never actually focused as much, as much attention on the actual murderer as they should have. And so if my family and I had had it our way, like I never would have been accused. I never would have been put on trial. This yeah. all would have been focused on Meredith and we would have all like agreed. But the fact that like the prosecution decided to sell a 
insanely sexist, totally made up story. And then the media, instead of holding them accountable to the truth and to the evidence, they just latched onto that story and ran with it and scandal mongered and got so much money out of it. And then like people come to me and say, well, how, how do you feel about the fact that Meredith has been forgotten? Like, don't you feel bad about that? And it's like, well, sure, but it's not my fault. Like I was never the one who made this not about Meredith. Yeah. That was the Italian justice system and the media. So, yeah, it was, I, uh, it was really crazy that, cause I do, I, I think that you're right. They did focus. I, Meredith was a, was a, was a sidebar in this whole fucking thing it was about how you were guilty mm-hmm. as opposed to you know it's like I, I think sometimes about nicole simpson and uh mm. and the, the kid that was with her goldman ron goldman oh yeah yeah i think it's ron goldman you know he gets forgotten he was also yeah. a human being just brutally brutally slashed. brutally murdered yeah. and he was also a guy that had dreams yeah uh it's it, yeah. heartbreaking um but you and when you say you reached out do you just send them messages on twitter so no <laughs> no um so there are a few people who have acted who have at least claimed to have been able to be intermediaries to send a message to them for me yeah um and they're in england yeah but i i, I honestly don't know if they've ever even received a message from yeah. me it's, i would i don't you know it's, it's one of those things that I, as a parent i don't think i need I, don't, I I would be like no I I I might yeah I I might just be like I don't need to tell like it's funny I, I've had a lot of people reach out to a lot of my friends have become alcoholics and then they want to apologize for what they've done mm. and I one of the coolest things I ever realized is I don't need to accept anyone's apology mm. like you don't have to accept someone's apology you can all just just go hey man I'm good I don't you must feel horrible but I feel horrible too yeah <laughs> yeah it's interesting I uh, the first time I had someone. Uh, who's you know doing the nine steps and one of the steps is you know you got to go make a forgiveness or whatever yeah i didn't realize it was happening my wife's like honey stop he's trying to apologize and i was mm. like oh it was interesting i let him so apologize. he was reaching out yeah and he, then you were just like i don't want to deal with you person. no 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 he oh. i he was i was like no it's fine whatever dude whatever i was blowing him off uh, and my wife's like hey this is part of his thing i went what and he and and, and i realized oh he's saying something and i said all right it was the first time I really got an apology, and I went, "All right, let's do it." Oh, the first time in your life, yeah, where I where <laughs> I was like, where I was like, I was like, because I'm I apologize very quickly, yeah, and I'm always find guilt on my own actions before anyone else's. So I kind of I've never really need to forgive people because I just find what I did wrong. Gosh, you would be slaughtered in an interrogation room. You have no idea, like. I feel I actually am also prone to this. Like, you know, if something bad is happening, I tend to feel like it's my fault. And mm-hmm. they call that vulnerable narcissism. I just learned that recently. Well, that, that tracks. <laughs> definitely a Where you just sort of like feel weirdly shame and that like that shame is because everything is everything bad is because of you. It's, I, they I, call it vulnerable narcissism. I had an issue. Um, I had an issue with with uh, two individuals. And I kept saying to my friends, what did I do? Like, Mm -hmm. I go, I I know nothing exists in a vacuum. Like I was there also. What did I do? Yeah. Like I want to find my accountability so then I can get to the end of it quicker. Right. Exactly. Like if I do my part, then we're all like, everyone just has to do their part. I, I totally feel you. Oh my gosh. That's, that's something that's a big deal for me. And I've, um, I found though that, a lot of the time it's not you and it's a someone projecting whatever issue it, that they is that or that, that they have onto you yep. and um that's a hard thing to wrap your mind around because you're that means you're helpless like i think the thing and i think the reason why i'm like i'm vulnerable narcissist and you're vulnerable narcissist is because we want to be problem solvers like Mm -hmm. basically we just want to like see that people are unhappy and be like oh let me fix it for you is it my fault great yeah but like if if the thing isn't really your fault and the thing that they're that you're being accused of or whatever like is not something that happened like how do you fix it yeah and you can't and then you're helpless and i can't i couldn't fix one of the things and then I, and then I found a way to fix one of them by allowing that person to blame me, mm. what they th- felt that I did. 
and I knew that it wasn't real. And I went, I said to my buddy, I was like, I don't think this is real, but I'm cool with it. Like I just need, I need cool it to be it. over. Okay. Yeah. And so, so, and, and so I, I remember that first apology, that first like legit AA apology. And I got to sit back and you get to actually decide, do I accept this apology? Mm-hmm. Do I, or, or is, am I, am I comfortable not forgiving this person because mm-hmm. there's there's a, a it is asking forgiveness it's not like yeah. getting it you, you don't yeah. get it you just say because you say i'm sorry that doesn't mean anything yeah i've got to go i accept that yeah i had a i had a really good friend i had a really good friend um drug me uh at my house one time what yeah man amanda you guys you should <laughs> these stories are old hat to everyone listening everyone listening is like <laughs> How do you sorry, not I need know to about this? watch a few specials. I guess I'm sorry. <laughs> and so he he drugged me and uh why? I don't know. I like Was this like a 70s thing? Like, oh, it's just funny to drug people. No. So me and Joe and uh Tom and this guy already do this thing, used to do this thing called Sober October every year. Okay. I, I saw one of them on the it's, there. yeah, it's up there. Yeah. And so um we would not drink or do drugs for the month of October. And we do this workout challenge and cleanse. Yeah. And cleanse. Ari was not a fan of it. He did not like it at all. And so I mean, he didn't have to do it. Well, yeah, we, we, we said that to him. Like, <laughs> this is so fucking bizarre. <laughs> so, so he, I, to maybe get retribution on me. I don't know. I'm not really certain. I could, here's the thing is that I don't know why he did it a hundred percent. But he drugged me. We're doing a podcast, and he slipped Molly in my drink, wow. and uh, yeah, and um, and uh, is he still your friend? So that's very interesting. So I didn't speak to him for like the entire month of October. We didn't drink. We didn't do drugs. We all did sober October, but I didn't speak to him. And at the very end of October, he called, and he was like, he was like, I'm. I'm really sorry, and I and I don't want this to affect our friendship. And he's like, "Did it fuck up our friendship?" And I had been so used to ex- getting apologies at that point and deciding. I said to him, "I said I'm gonna have to f- figure it out, yeah, because I got to know if I can forgive you, if I can still love you." So yeah. I fucking loved. Like before that incident, there was no wavering in how much I knew I could trust Ari. Yeah, I told I, and like I have a thing. I have a thing about that. Uh, sets me off that if, if people think i'm weak um it's because they mistake kindness for weakness so I'm, I'm a very kind person yeah and so but some people will capitalize on that kindness and then just call you weak and i've told joe and ari and tom know this very much about me who, who are you hanging out with <laughs> like, like no no no, no is, i'm talking that's 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 a broad oh, stroke in general that's okay, a broad okay, stroke okay, of okay. mostly of, of like people i don't know People, I see. Okay. people that maybe a radio guy that runs a radio station or, or, or like another comic okay. or, you know, like just any, someone in the business, an executive or, and okay. so, um, and I'd all told them that and they knew that they knew that that was one of the things that drove me nuts was when people assume because I'm such a generous guy or I'm such a nice guy yeah. and I, that I, that I'm weak. And I told Ari, I was like, that fucked with the weak thing. Cause mm. it made me feel like you thought I was weak. And he was like, Oh fuck. He was like, oh, I wish I could go back and take that back. And and I got it up, and Leanne, my wife, did not accept his apology. And she's like, he's no longer welcome in our house. My daughters did not accept his apology, and they- Well, they, I could see them also, because like that's like a fucking women thing, too. Like, you don't fuck with people's drinks. Like, you just don't yeah. do it. Well, he, my daughters, and it just, it fucked everything up, but I was, I was able, in my opinion, to forgive him. And to know that I that his friendship was very valuable to me. Mm-hmm. I I love confiding in him. I love talking to him about things. I that never changed. It was just one silly. I could I could see that that was one silly act that he thought wasn't gonna bother me, but like it did. Hmm. And is because he a he, comedian? He's too? a comedian. He's a very 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 good comedian. And he's but his he runs in circles where drugging each other is not a big deal. Um, like a lot of the guys. Like has they, he done it before to other people? He's done it. He's done it he's yeah i think so yeah they all they all used to just you know put stuff in each other's drinks and okay it's it was, so it is kind of the 70s thing yeah it's it's just, it's just fucking with each other and it's not it was never frowned upon in that group but when it happened to me I, it was just it was a little it was different for me obviously i was a little more but um but yeah but forgiveness is a very interesting thing so there's a couple of people i have not forgiven who've asked for forgiveness and i and i'm i thought no my buddy Segura, Tom Segura, said to me one time, 
sometimes if you forgive people, they get back in your life. And do you want them in your life? And I was like, right. no. Hmm. He's like, then you got to be careful with who you forgive. That's an interesting point. Um, and I'm, I'd be curious, like, what, like, for me, the thing that I want to know from someone who I would want to forgive, um, and I do want to forgive people a lot because I also don't like feeling angry at people. Um, but I want to know that they understand why I'm upset. They want, I want to know that one, they, they appreciate that I am upset and I have a right to be upset and they understand why so that I can feel safe again in their, in their space. So they, they like, I don't want that to happen again. I don't want to have like a re I, I want to regain trust. And like that trust is having that person acknowledge my feelings and a, acknowledge what needs to happen from now on so that I can trust you again. Do you feel like the person that you did forgive was appreciably doing that for you that the others were not? Uh, I was, I was very accurate. Well, one person I kind of, one person I kind of wish I had forgived um, earlier and I still haven't forgiven. Them. I mean, I, I've, I've, I've forgotten them. Hmm. I've just forgotten them. Hmm. Um, they don't occupy space in my head. Um, one person I forgave, one person I forgave got sober and reached out to me and I forgave him and his apology wasn't even accurate. <laughs> See, that's that's the worst when they're like trying and you're like, that's not even why I'm mad. But like, I'm such a, on. what you would call a vulnerable narcissist or whatever, <laughs> that I accepted that his recollection of events everyone's recollection of everything is different no that's one fair. has to, and, and and if if that's the way he does recall it and he wants to get past us and and be forgiven then i just have to accept accept that that's where he's at i wish i could tell you all these people's names it makes it so much more interesting interesting this podcast is sponsored by better help online therapy we talk a lot about better help on this show we talk a lot about therapy and this month we're going to discuss some of the stigmas around mental health it's crazy to me that there are any stigmas. And I and I say that so that you should be rest assured that if you're thinking about getting help, you don't have to wait until it's too late. Therapy isn't something people go to when life becomes unbearable. It, therapy is a good tool to utilize before things get worse, and it can help to avoid those lows. Many pink think therapy is so called for so-called crazy people. Uh how about this? Tom Segura is in therapy, okay? I was going to say I'm in therapy, but I don't think that really. <laughs> I am in therapy. Leanne's in therapy. Leanne's not crazy. You know that. Leanne's been a big proponent of therapists. Therapy doesn't mean something's wrong with you. It means you recognize that all humans have emotions and we need to learn to control them and not avoid them. Uh, BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist. So you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to, and you don't have to wait in traffic. That's the reason I like this therapy. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Give it a try and see why over 2 million people have used BetterHelp Online Therapy and BurtCast listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash Burt. That's BetterHelp.com slash Burt. If you own a business, you, you know there aren't enough hours in the day to waste playing phone tag. The list of customers you need to reach doesn't get any shorter, especially when business is good. That's why local businesses everywhere turn to Podium. Podium makes every interaction as easy as sending a text. So everything that makes your business great can get done fast. I love Podium because texting is where everyone's at. I'm Who the hell has time to write an email or send a fucking phone call? Or, or I like to FaceTime, but no one likes to answer FaceTimes. Podium isn't just a better way to communicate. It's a better way to do everything, gathering reviews, collecting payments, even marketing to your customers. Podium makes it all as easy as pressing send. You won't just free up more time. You're going to grow your business and get more done. With Podium, you'll close deals with customers before competition has even a chance to call them back. Join the more than 100,000 businesses already using Podium to streamline their customer interactions. Get started for free at podium.com slash Bert or sign up for a paid Podium account and get a free credit card reader. Restrictions apply. That's podium.com slash Bert. Do you forgive the prosecutor? Or the? Uh, do you forgive the people that did you wrong in Italy? Have you spoken to any of them? Have they, any of them apologized? 
So no one has apologized. Um, I have been doing, um, I have this sort of ongoing project um, to reach out to my prosecutor and communicate with him. I can't really say much about that, um, but it is important to me to feel like, I don't even know why it's that important to me. I guess I felt like I was so quickly judged before anyone ever even knew who I was. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, so horribly judged, like just basically people just made up a cartoon villain and then like cast me as that character without me having ever auditioned for it. And, um, I have this sort of like fixation on the idea of proving them wrong. Um, and like, just, just to see what would happen. Like, I'm genuinely curious to know if like, if my prosecutor understood who I really am and not the cartoon villain that he created in his mind, like, what would he do? Like, would he, would he, would he change? Would, would something change? Would somebody next time not get hurt or, or is everyone going to perpetually just justify themselves into oblivion no matter who they've hurt and no matter what wrong they've done? Like that's the sort of. But there is a, this is a bizarre thought and you do not have to co-sign on this thought at all. Okay. <laughs> but I, I, as you're saying that, I thought, they, I bet I bet they believe themselves to be right. I bet they believe themselves to be right. How powerful in their eyes, you're a fucking savage murderer. How powerful would it be just to show up one of their kids' soccer games? Just not. Oh, <laughs> like, no. I, 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 <laughs> is that fucking horrible? And just be like, you're next. And then, because oh, if they God. believe it. <laughs> well, what's what would be more interesting to me is if someone found themselves in a position to say, oh, that person is not who I thought they were, but I'm still right. That's more interesting to me. Like, how do you do that cognitive dissonance? What, how, how does that cognitive dissonance happen? And I think that that honestly is a more human experience than, than people will acknowledge. That like, you can even have someone prove you wrong right to your face. Like, I am not the person that you thought I was. And they can still justify to themselves that they were right all along. How does that happen? How does that happen? Because I, I have, it's funny, it's hard to change your opinion on a person. Well, especially even more importantly, it's hard to change your opinion about yourself. If you're the kind of person who judged someone to be a murderer, what does it mean about yourself if that person turns out that they're not a murderer? Yeah. What does that mean about yourself? So I think the bigger issue is not so much about changing your opinion about other people. It's about changing your opinion about yourself. What kind of person are you if you wrongfully convicted someone? So have you, ha no one? No one's ever apologized to me, no. When, you, when, you, when they say, that's it, well, you 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 did four years, and then they sent you, they kept you guilty, but sent you home for no. So in Italy, um, they do double jeopardy in a different way. Um, so I was found guilty, I was acquitted, I was sent home, then I was tried again, I was found guilty, and then I was tried again, and I was found innocent. So so you've been innocent twice and guilty twice. Yes. So you found guilty, then acquitted. Yes. How how does that happen? I mean, I'm, so like, I um I and at the trial level I was found guilty. At the appeals level I was found I was acquitted, and then I was. But and then, then and then and so that that first acquitted was is that four years? That was four years. Yeah. And so that day that you get found acquitted, I was released from prison. That tell me about that day. Like what was <laughs> like? Um. So. Uh, the no day details too small. Okay. Um, so it was December, so it was really cold. Um, Do you get jackets in prison? I mean, yes, there aren't uniforms. So you just get what your family gives oh, you. Can you can just wear your clothes. You, you can wear clothes, but there are certain things you couldn't wear. Like, I don't think I could wear these jeans. Oh, actually, I could wear these jeans because you'll notice that the button here doesn't have a cap over it. If you have a cap over it, you can hide drugs in the button, so you can't wear those kinds of jeans. Um, but I could wear this kind of jeans. Not so a lot of Uniqlo. Going on. It's, it's a it's a small amount of drugs. So 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 
You're, it's cold out. It's, it's December. It's December. It's cold. Do you have any inkling that they're going to be finding you innocent? Oh, so oh, actually, I'm sorry. I'm taking you to my convi- um when I was found guilty. I was acquitted in October. It was still cold, but not as cold. Uh, two years later. Yes. Two years later. So you were found guilty in December. Yes. That yeah. must have been a rough day. That was a very bad day. Yes, my entire family um, had showed up in. I have a very close extended family and all of them came to Italy to basically take me back home. We had all been like in what my mom was calling this like dark tunnel, like trying to see the light at the end of the tunnel. And we were convinced that it was going to be when the verdict was handed down. Like none of us were prepared for a guilty verdict. None of us. Like my dad, like we were so prepared for them to take me home that my dad brought my two youngest sisters who are much younger than me who were like, gosh, you know, like 11 and 13 at the time and brought them with the understanding this was going to be a happy moment. And then it was not. And it was devastating. And um, it, uh, so like my mom brought me, my mom bought me a special coat that was green for good luck. And like she had the like guards bring it back to me so that I could put on this coat um, for the verdict. And um, I remember that the um, every time I went into the courtroom, it was always really loud because there were always journalists who were like yelling and cameras clicking and blah, blah, blah. And this that time I walked in and it was silent. Um, It was it felt a little bit now in retrospect, it felt like I was walking into my own funeral. Um, like everyone was just like, it felt like everyone was there to see the ax fall. And, um, and indeed the, when the, finally the judge and jury came back in from chambers, um, I remember I couldn't really understand them, not because I hadn't learned Italian by then, but because I sort of had this like, echoing in my ears. I, I, it sounded a little bit like wah, 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 wah. Um, but I did make out colpevole, guilty. Um, I did not make out how many years I had been sentenced. I just heard that. And I heard that after someone behind me yelled, no, I don't know who it was. Someone who understood Italian, who understood what the judge was saying understood that I was being found guilty and they just hadn't pronounced it yet. Um, they yelled, no, I heard colpevole. And then I heard my family crying. And I, I think I actually should ask, um, there's this really nice young woman who, um, act as a translator for my family because like they didn't have a translator. It was Italian courtroom. Everyone was speaking Italian. So my family, most of the time that they were there, didn't know what the hell was going on. Mm. But there was a young woman who was around my age who volunteered to to translate for them. And I wonder if she was the one who said no. Um, I should ask her. Um, anyway, I, I never... I just know that my family started crying very quickly, which is to say that someone was live translating for them. And, um, I like the feeling of collapse, um, there it's my, my world collapsed. Like everything I thought to be true about the world was gone. I felt like there was no floor and I was, I was like floating in space, not knowing which way was up. Um, and in fact, like the guards had to like sort of physically carry me out of the, like they held me on both the arms and like carried me out of this room. Um, because I had just been told that like the truth didn't matter. My innocence didn't matter that I was not just like a, someone who was waiting to go home with my family. I was like done. Like this was my life. Like this wasn't just like this weird little interlude. It was my life and like I, it was over. And, um, my, one of my lawyers chased me out of the courtroom and he was like, Amanda, we're going to fix this. We're going to fix this. And I was just like, how, like, if the truth doesn't matter, like, how do you fix this? So, um, 
like I on the one hand, I like I feel you in the just being like, whatever, you know, you see it your way. I see it my way. You're sorry for what you think happened. That's fine. And that's good enough. Um, but sometimes it's not good enough. Um, and granted, like I was acquitted. Eventually I got to go home. Eventually I got to start a family. Eventually I got to like have my life back. My life was not over. Um, but I don't know if the people who did, who are responsible for it, like understand what they did. And it would mean a lot to me if they understood. Um, and, and what's crazy is like, you can do something that horrible and not know that you're doing it. Like, you don't have Mm -hmm. to be like, I am ruining the life of an innocent girl right now. Good for me. Like you can think you're doing the right thing the entire time and still be doing the wrong thing. Yeah. And so that is like that complicated, um, cognitive dissonance space that I'm talking about where it's like, what must it feel like? I almost feel bad for my prosecutor. I almost feel like I should just leave him alone because he would feel much better about himself if I just left him alone. I I couldn't leave him alone. Well, and that's kind of my feeling is it's like, maybe, maybe this is me being unkind by like reaching out to him and being like, I think we need to talk because like, ultimately I'm actually potentially forcing him to see something about himself that he's not going to like. Oh, it's it's the, um, the kid, the guy that, um, the guy that railroaded the Duke rape kids. Yeah. I, I think about that guy. What was his name, Halston? Um, he was a horrible human being. He was a horrible human being. And, and there's, and this must have happened. This must have happened. This is what kills me to with your case is there had to be moments where someone was like hey man just so you know her dna is not in there yeah like there 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 are certain facts to your case where they had they had to willfully overlook them yeah that's the hard thing um like and i keep wondering and there are different people i've talked to have different ideas about how like what the mental process was for them like Oh, did they hear no no DNA linking Amanda to this crime? Did they hear that and go, oh, weird, maybe I'm wrong? Or did they think, oh, Amanda must just be a criminal mastermind? She cleaned, cleaned up. up I remember her hearing DNA. that you yeah. cleaned up all your DNA. And left. That's not him. Mike Nifong. Mike Nifong. Oh, I think he's dead. From Here, the- go- Google Mike Nifong. Uh, this guy was a fucking garbage human being. Is he? He railroaded these guys. I hope he is. <laughs> he railroaded these guys. And in I saw a documentary about it. And that he was like, he was like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. This is gonna get me reelected. I don't give a fuck if it's ruining um, their lives. This is gonna he get me reelected. Actually said that? Uh, I'm obviously I'm paraphrasing right. a documentary. I told you I'm not good with facts. But uh he is alive. Well, he's bankrupt, sued by the players. Yeah, yeah. Later developments. It, what did it say, Halston? He he actually willfully said, I don't care. I, he knew they were innocent. He didn't care. He just, this was giving him momentum on a reelection, correct? Is is that what it is? Yeah, no, that, that definitely happens. And I think that that's actually really interesting because it reminds me of like how the journalists treated my case where they were like, oh, you know, guilty, innocent doesn't really matter as it's long as it's bait. a good story, yeah. as long as I'm getting paid. And it's like, how do you get, like, how do we all get so stuck in our routine, like so jaded through our work that we forget that there are human consequences? I, it, that's interesting you say that. Um, that's very interesting you say that because it, it happens in every level. I, I remember I made a very cognizant decision on my podcast, on my mostly on two bears, but uh, to ne- never talk negative about anybody. And and I would just talk shit. I would just talk shit, just out of my ass, I, just to fill time. And you'd just be like, like I don't really like I fucking like what kind of stuff. But nothing really bad. I I would imagine you'd giggle at it if you heard it. My intent was to make you laugh, obviously. Sure, sure. I don't know. Just like I, you'd just get done, and you'd be like, "Did I talk shit about Reese Witherspoon?" <laughs> or oh, I, like, and I by see. the way, I like Reese Witherspoon a lot. But you're just like you're just using an example when she got pulled over for a DUI. Uh, and she, she should not have been speaking 
and they were recording the whole thing. And, and I don't know, you just are ranting. You're trying to find a joke. And I, I never really had a line. I never really cared if where, what direction the line was on. I just wanted yeah. to make sure it was funny. And then I started saying, well, I don't, I don't want to have like, God forbid I, uh, I talked positive about this guy. The guy who was telling you that's coming on my podcast tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the surfer. Yeah, yeah. I talked positive about him and then he reached out. And then what's in- very interesting is I started legit saying, I, I don't want to be negative. I, I, there are negative comics in, in there, and, but I, that's not who I am. And when I went on Joe's podcast, and this Joe's podcast is a perfect example of me talking shit and not realizing what I'm saying. So I get drunk, I get high, I don't remember any of it. Okay. And then, and you're just riffing. You're like just just anything, the ball anything that keeps anything that you can find humor in. And I just made a cognizant choice to not say anything negative. And in, in return, I said positive things about a number of people who each reached out to me, yourself included, and were like, "Hey, thank you for the kind words." And I was like. That's so much better than getting a fucking shirt from <laughs> Dak Shepard, like fucking going, did I, what did I say about Dak Shepard? <laughs> like, oh. I like Dak Shepard, but you know, you get on a roll and you're like, I don't yeah. even know what the fuck I said about Dak Shepard, but I, I got a shirt from his podcast, like just in the mail, like almost like a dead horse's head. And I was like, <laughs> the fuck did I say about Dak Shepard? Well, you know what? That's why Weird Al is such a genius because he's always positive. He's always funny. Yeah. He's a genius. See, this is a perfect time for me not to talk shit. <laughs> so I was going to go, genius is a fucking heavy word. Okay, but- well. <laughs> <laughs> I like Weird Al a lot. I see, like, it is, so, like it's, it gets slippery because the, 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 I have a joke in my head and I just bite my tongue on the jokes. So I go, it's not worth it. I want well, weird. I it, is it because it's easy, though? Like, maybe that's the trick. Like, maybe negative well, I have jokes. Another joke in my ah! head. I have another joke in my head. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how to respond. <laughs> I like Weird Al. I like Weird Al. Okay. I like Weird Al. I like. I've always liked him. I think he is a very innovative, uh, very brilliant dude. Very very brilliant dude. And I have to say, always that. positive. Always, always positive. Always positive. Oh Jesus! <laughs> Fucking. Is there alcohol in this? <laughs> I think there is. Right. I'm gonna end up putting kombucha? this uh, this unicorn smooge on my face. <laughs> Uh, I'm making smash burgers tonight. How did you celebrate birthdays in prison? Didn't. You didn't? Did you tell anyone it was your birthday? Actually, there was um, uh, uh, another American who was um, locked up in there who one time on my birthday, she worked in the kitchens. She was able to make me a chocolate cake. She White actually, chick? She was, yeah. What was she, what was she in prison for? She had a, a Italian boyfriend who bought her a whole new brand new set of luggage to go and visit him in Italy. And he had laced her entire luggage with cocaine, um, unbeknownst to her. And so she showed up in Italy to meet him and his family. He didn't actually exist. Fake name, everything. And she was arrested at the airport. Is she still in prison? No, no, no. She was got five years. Oh, wow. Do yeah. you keep in touch with her? Mm hmm. Really? Yeah, I actually saw her Are you on, yesterday. Is she on Instagram? Is she lives in LA? No, no, no. Um, I was in Seattle yesterday. Yeah. I flew here this morning. Where's the University of Oregon? Eugene, right? Uh, yes. Um, wait. So wait. Maybe? Is she? Was she pretty? Um, I mean, I've seen pictures of her when she was young. She was she was in her fifties when I met oh. her, and then and now she's in her sixties, and she's a beautiful woman. But yeah. you know, she was gorgeous when she was my age. Really, like redonk, long red hair. Ooh, yeah. So wait, what were the other prisoners like? Wait, and go go back. I want to know about the day you were found innocent. <laughs> okay. Slow roll me on that day. Well, no details too small. Okay, so the like, did time you have I was first that acquitted. Or first acquitted. First acquitted. So I'm still in jail. Because that, because in my book, in my book, when I look at your trial, and I understand that you're going to see it very differently than I see it, <laughs> but you're found guilty, then you're acquitted, and you're allowed to go home, correct? Yes. And then, and then you get found guilty again. And not to be disrespectful to how much that must have, but I go, that's just headache stuff and, and fearful stuff. Getting out of that fucking prison for me. Yes. No. Getting out of that fucking yes. prison is when I go. Like I want to know what that feels like yes so that feeling um is hard to describe do they tell you Uh, the beginning of the day the end of the day so it was at at, like nighttime when i was finally called back in they took many many hours to deliberate in chambers um which was interesting because we didn't know what that meant if that was a good sign or a bad sign 
Um, but my lawyers, the longer it took for the chambers to come back and say we were, were ready to give a verdict, the more my attorneys were like, maybe this is going to go well because they're not going to be taking this long to just agree with a guilty verdict. Like maybe they're really, really deliberating on this. And what were the facts that they were deliberating on? Were they? Yeah. So um, in the appeals trial, there were key pieces of forensic evidence that were basically the the basis of the conviction in the first trial that had been reevaluated by independent experts and called deeply into question. In fact, totally obliterated as evidence. And so the court was then left with, well, if these these pieces of evidence that the prosecution's case rested on, if those no longer are there, then what is the case against her? Like, it, is there any evidence against her? Mm-hmm. And there wasn't. There was no so, evidence against you. Exactly. So they deliberated for many, many, many hours. And in those hours, while they were deliberating, I was just in prison and I was waiting. And um, you knew this was the day? I did not know this was the day. I mean, I knew it was the day I was going to get a verdict. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I had been called in for them to say, like, okay, we've heard final arguments from everybody. We're going into chambers. It's going to be several hours, right? And, and so, then, and and so, you knew that's the day. Are you are you hopeful, or are you are you at this point going like, I it, I I can't get my hopes up. So I was gutted from my first trial when I felt like I had every hope in the world and it turned out like I didn't know what a, a, a innocent verdict would rest on if the truth didn't matter anymore. Right. Right. So I was not there thinking, oh, everything is going to be turning out all right for me. Mm-hmm. I was preparing myself for to hear the worst because I had not prepared myself the first time and yeah. it had been a very bad experience for me. So I was preparing myself to hear the worst. I went back to the prison. Um, I actually was given like the choice. I can either wait in a prison cell in the courthouse, which was very cold and like a sort of like dungeony mm. cell that was very small, or I could go back to the prison to my room and and just like hang out. And I decided to go back to the prison. And there was a priest that worked at the prison. I'm I'm an atheist, but um, there I was friends with the priest who worked at the prison. We played music together. And he invited me. Do you think that that's maybe why you got in trouble in the first place? You didn't accept Jesus Christ into your heart. (laughs) I mean, didn't help. Didn't help. Um, But yeah, no, we played music together. (laughs) He was a good friend of mine. Um, And I went to his office and we, I stayed very, very long there and we just played music together. And interestingly, um, he was convinced that it was going to turn out okay. Um, he was so convinced that he had brought in against regulation a little voice recorder um, so that he could record me singing because he was like, this is the last time I'm ever going to hear you sing. And um, we just played music together and um, I cried a lot. And um, and eventually he, he had to go. He had to go back to his, you know, wherever he lives, his seminary. Um, and I had to go back up to my room and wait the final like hours into the evening. And it was um, 10 or 11 at night before I was finally called back into court. Um, and they brought me into court. Um, it was it was so bizarre because again, they, they bring you into this like little dungeon cell and it's, it's, um, it's brick walls and uh, like a really simple bench and that's it in the cell and then there's this like iron grate like you'd see in like a dog kennel and that was that was where I hung out while I was waiting to go into court and outside of that was like a sort of seating area for um the guards and the guards at the time were all casting bets on what the verdict would be um and by the way as a storyteller that's a fucking that's a that's a fucking that's an oak that is a fucking oak <laughs> that is a fuck see those when i those details that's what i love in a oh my god yeah um so anyway they brought me in eventually like you weren't even there like you were a ghost like i was a ghost or you know like they honestly were nice to me like the guards when I was at court were usually very nice. I mean, one guard at one point um, even came into my cell and taught me how to salsa. 
<laughs> at one point, but that was like not that day. That day I was just sort of sitting and subdued, but he came into my cell and was like, oh, this is how you salsa. I was like, okay. Um, they would like bring me little espressos or something like that. Well, like from a machine. Anyway, they brought me up there and, um, and again, like the court comes in, they're very somber. The judge sort of stands up there. He's reading from a piece of paper and I, I can hear it this time. I'm not hearing the wah, 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 wah. So I'm, I'm intently listening to what he's saying. My, my lawyer is holding onto my hand and gripping it really, really firmly. He's got like this, um, sort of warm meaty hand and he like takes my hand and like just envelops it. And, and then like I hear just, so first of all, I heard cold pay volet for slander. I was found guilty for slander, um, which is again, like the, for signing those statements. So they found me guilty of slander and he says, you are sentenced to three years for, um, this guilty of slander thing. And so I'm thinking, oh no, it, it's, it's happening all over board, again. Yeah. It's happening all over again. But then he says, acquitted and what's that in italian um assolta assolta and and then and then and then the even more crazy thing was and a me to be immediately released so i'm just like i start bawling like i lose it family i there? Is lose family it my dead? family is there I start bawling and lose it. And my family thinks that it went the wrong way because again, they can't understand Italian. (laughs) So they see me losing it. But thankfully there's that girl who's translating for them, who's explaining to them, no, it's okay. It's okay. So they're like hugging each other as I'm like, I'm whisked away very quickly. Cause the, all of a sudden that quiet courtroom explodes. Like everyone's talking like cameras, every like blah. And so we're whisked out of the courtroom. I, I remember I was passing by and I was crying and, um, Raffaele's attorney, who is a is woman. Raffaele there? Yeah. Raffaele, we were, we were always tried at the same time. So Raffaele was Instagram? always there. He is on Instagram. Yeah. I'm follow him. Yeah, you should. What's his, yeah. What's his, uh... Rafa Solaris. Yeah. And he's on Twitter too. Is he really? Yeah. Um, anyway, so. I... Sorry. I'm the worst <laughs> interviewer. I'm the worst interviewer. There are people in their cars going, shut the fuck up, Bert. Um, uh, so, yeah, so I'm passing by and she sees me like bawling and she like says like she gives me a thumbs up because I think she's concerned that I didn't understand. And we get taken out of the courtroom and then we are brought back to that same room, right, where there's these two cells, but they don't put us back in the cells. They sit us in their room with them. With the guards. With the guards. Where they the were guards betting. sit me. Well, yeah, exactly. Where they like, were just like hanging half of them out. Like, we casually. Won. And the other Indeed, ones were like, some of them were like, we won. Good job. <laughs> and then some were like, uh, good luck for you. <laughs> no, none of good them. day for you. Well, they were all they all seemed really happy for me. Um, but also they were like very, very keen on making sure that I understood what had happened. Because and it was when they let they allowed Raffaele and me to hug. We were not allowed to like touch each other, much less look at each other really? while we were like on trial. But as soon as we were acquitted, we were allowed to like hug each other. Is that you? That's me. Yeah. Okay. I didn't follow you. Now I'm following you and you follow Raphael, I'm guessing. Yes. R-A-F. Solcaliti? Solecito? Solecito. Here, I can find it for you. I got him. Okay. You got him. Let's see what he looks like. Oh, Wow. That's not at all what I thought he was going to like. Very, very much more Caucasian than I thought he'd be. Yeah, he's, um, yeah, he's got me vibes. Like, he's got, like, brown hair and yeah. he's pale, yeah. You guys could be brother and sister. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Actually, I think we look more like brother and sister than um, anything else. So, uh, so then how quick are you let out of the jail? Like, like, what's the, what's the timeline? Are you, are you hitting your parents up going, make dinner reservations? More like I'm, so again, uh, the difference, like the shift. So I was brought to that courtroom in a prison van, which is windowless and bars. And I'm brought back in a police car with windows and no bars. And I'm brought back to the prison and I am brought to my cell very quickly to just get my things 
Like I'm out now, like to be immediately released. So I go back to the prison just for enough time to get my stuff. They give me a few extra minutes to run up and down the, the, the cell block to say goodbye to people. But meanwhile, they're like, you have to get out. You're not legally allowed to be here anymore. Because now, now if something happens to you, fucking they're yeah. in big trouble. Yeah. So meanwhile, everyone is screaming the entire like I come back to the prison and already everyone has been watching it on TV and everyone is screaming and pounding pots and pans against the bars. Happy for you. Yes. Okay. They're all screaming, yeah. Liberta, Liberta. Oh, I'm gonna make liberta. me cry. <laughs> Jesus Christ. And granted, like we we this is a tradition that we do for anyone who's getting out. Like we we say Liberta, Liberta, and we bang pots and pans, but this was the first time I had heard every single building every building like the men's side the, the women's side it's <laughs> like such a great moment to have yeah it was a, it was a really good moment and people like just like i've never seen i'll never see them again like who i spent years of my life with i just i just have to say like bye now and Whoa. you know good luck and meanwhile you remember as you're leaving to scrape your foot on the threshold of the um of the door so that you um, uh, symbolically carry the next person out with you. Um, so anyway, we, they gave me my, um, my passport and, and, um, and they had arranged a car for me to drive me out. And then from there I was driven out into a mad car race with paparazzi ramming our cars from behind, um, into the darkness to a safe house in Rome that had been prepared for me um, with by supporters. So, yeah. what was the price tag on all this? I, um, I mean, I eventually paid back my parents what they said oh, it all Jesus costs. Christ. I doubt that they told me everything, and I also know that a number of people gave their time for free or gave their whatever they had for free. Like, for instance, there was a. Um, person who worked for British Airways who gave my family all of his miles. There was a former FBI agent who coordinated with, um, you know, the local authorities, my escape from prison, basically. Like that whole car thing oh, situation was yeah. not unusual. What normally happens is they give you a garbage bag to put your stuff in and then you walk out the door. And I would have walked out into a throng of paparazzi. So instead, they organized a car for me that was driven by a professional driver with an FBI, like ex FBI agent in the front seat. And we booked it into the night, like turned off the lights and were just driving in pitch darkness and like the Jesus. fields behind, like the, you know, like sunflower fields behind the prison to like find our way to Rome while paparazzi are chasing us. And it was, it was a big deal. And this is the same, Ra Raffaele has gotten the same things happening. Honestly, I have not asked Raffaele how he, him leaving prison was like, um, because I don't know actually how he got out. Um, he, and I've seen him multiple times since, which is ridiculous. I can't believe I've never asked him before. Um, I'm sure they probably arranged something else for him, but he didn't, he wasn't leaving the country. He was going back home to his family and that sucked for him because meanwhile, like I get to at least go home to a world, like to a place where there were people at the airport with like, welcome home, Amanda signs, like people I didn't know who cared about me, who showed up just to say like, welcome home. Like the local record store put up on their sign, like welcome home, Amanda, like not, you know, and Nirvana for and, sale. And you come, to a, <laughs> you come to a country where everyone I think is on your team. Yeah. It's, it, I, I that's say, what it I, felt like yeah. when I came home. Yeah. Raffaele did not go home to that feeling. Really? Like, granted, ever like basically his hometown really rallied behind him, but Italy didn't. Yeah. And so he was living as a kind of unwanted individual for those years while we were still on trial, and you know potentially like we were found guilty again, and we're potentially going to be going back to prison. <laughs> If you're looking for a present for someone this Christmas or holiday season, it's a no-brainer. Skylight Frames. I'm telling you, this is the perfect gift for anyone you love in your life. If it's, I have told you this a million times, uh, I have no bought no less than 15 Skylight Frames. 
I buy them for everyone. They're easy to set up. You can set it up in under 60 seconds. It's a beautiful 10-inch screen, um, touch screen. It's gorgeous. They give you 100% satisfaction guaranteed. So if you don't love it, they're going to give you a full refund. But more importantly, you send them the frame, then you can load it up with photos, or you can just get it to them blank, and then what you do is you email uh, this, you email pictures to this one photo place and it goes up on everyone's skylight frame. And the reason I did it for all my friends is because I can have pictures of myself at my friend's house. It's the, my favorite thing ever. It is like a game changer. How often do you go to your friend's house and you just see pictures of them? Now I see pictures of myself and you can swipe through. It's great. It's, it's a way we all stay connected. Me and my friends, my families, my family, my sisters, everyone. It is a no brainer. Get a skylight frame for someone you love. It is the best gift. Right now is a special offer. You can get $10 off your purchase of a Skylight Frame when you go to skylightframe.com and enter the code BERT. That's right. To get $10 off your purchase of a Skylight Frame, just go to skylightframe.com and enter the code BERT. That's S-K-Y-L-I-G-H-T-F-R-A-M-E.com, and the promo code is BERT. We have one good sleeping room in our house, and it's because of this Helix mattress. We got a Helix mattress in our guest bedroom. And everyone fights to sleep in there. It was amazing. It was super easy to set up. Came in a box. Cut the box open. I mean, Leanne and the girls put it together and put it on. And it was there. It was ready in minutes. It's awesome. If you're looking for a bed, go to Helix. They have a quiz. It takes just two minutes to complete and matches your body type and sleep preferences to the for the perfect mattress for you. Why would you buy a mattress made for someone else, right? And who wants to go... It, it's so much better than going to a mattress store and starting to lay on mattresses. You go like, I think. I don't know. It's a lot of pressure. Everyone's unique, and Helix knows that. So they have several different mattress models to choose from. They have soft, medium, firm uh, mattresses that are meant for cooling. If you sleep hot, I like to sleep hot. And uh, mattress meant for spinal alignment to prevent morning aches and pains. They even have a Helix Plus for plus size sleepers, Tom. Good for you. I took the Helix quiz. We were matched. Uh, Liam and I took it. We were matched with uh, the the hot firm, and it's fucking awesome. I sleep on my side. I move around a lot. Um, but Leanne sleeps different. Uh, so we matched, we, we, uh, Leanne really took the quiz, to be honest with you. She's the one that's going to be sleeping at the most because I snore. I don't know. So if you're looking for a mattress, take the quiz. You order the mattress that gets matched to you. The mattress comes right to your door for free. If you don't, you don't even have to go to a mattress store ever again. How great is that? Who wants to drive down the street with a mattress on top of their car? Helix is awesome, but you don't need to take my word for it. They were awarded the number one best overall mattress pick of 2020 by GQ and Wired Magazine. Helix has re been recommended by multiple leading chiropractors and doctors of sleep medicine as a go-to solution for improving sleep. Just go to helixsleep.com slash BERT. Take their two-minute quiz, and they're going to match you with a customized mattress and give you the best sleep of your fucking life. I promise you. They have a 10-year warranty also, so if you try it out for 100 nights, you can try it out for 100 nights risk-free. They're even going to pick it up for you if you don't love it, but you will, okay? Helix even has financing options and flexible payment plans, so a great night's sleep is never far away. Helix is offering up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners at helixsleep.com slash BERT. That's helixsleep.com slash BERT. Remember, Helix is offering $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows to all our listeners at helixsleep.com slash Bert. How do you get find, found guilty again? Well, so again, they do double jeopardy differently there. So in Italy, they have three levels of justice. There's the trial level, the appellate level, and then what their version of the Supreme Court. And all trials, like all cases have to go through all three levels before they're considered definitive. And what happened in my case is I was found guilty at the trial level. I was acquitted at the appellate level, but my prosecutor appealed my acquittal, which you are allowed to do in Italy. And my acquittal was overturned by the Supreme Court and sent back for retrial at the appellate level. I was found guilty again. And then the Supreme Court in Italy overturned my conviction and definitively acquitted me. So if you go to Italy, nothing happens to you. Or you spend four years in prison for something you didn't do. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. That. <laughs> so. what, kind, what, kind, what kind of crazy offers have you been give, given? Like they go, Hey, we want you to host a reality show. Oh, because I'm sure you have, have gotten crazy offers. Well, 
I had the um the frankly quite insulting offer of twenty grand to do a porno. Twenty grand, come on. Hey. <laughs> You got to shoot your shot, right? <laughs> um, so someone offered me that. So what, what is the so- price point? <laughs> <laughs> What's my price point? What yeah, what is price your price point? point? Let's start. Let's work it backwards. I would, to do a porn. See, I think I could probably still keep working if I did a porn. See, that's that's the difference between you and me. People would just see me doing a porn and be like, oh, that means that she's guilty of murder. Like, that's what's stupid, too, because, like, I have friends who are in the sex business and, like, I think it's a perfectly fine business to be mm-hmm. in. Um, I just am not allowed to be in it. I don't I don't blame you. My daughters aren't allowed to be in it either, just for the record. OK. Um, <laughs> but what, what else? Like, do you ever get offered to host a reality show or Dancing with the Stars? Or I have been um, asked to do Dancing with the Stars. Um which is funny because I do actually like to dance and I'm actually pretty good at it. I'm, I'm not good at all kinds of dancing, but I do um, swing dance. Me and my husband swing dance together um, and we love it. So I love to dance. I love ballroom dancing. I can't like moonwalk or anything. Yeah. Well, no, I, should, <laughs> I can moon hand. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, no, but I didn't do that because again, like my sort of, problem is that before anyone knew that I was a real person, they knew me to be a tabloid person. They knew me to be a person that you don't take seriously, that you ridicule, that you use as a derogatory term. Yeah. And I've been digging myself out of that grave for my entire adult life. And it would it would it would seem weird to, for you to be on Dancing with the Stars. And just and from my perspective, I'd be like I'm not a celebrity. Well, it's it was, but you are. But but it's I'm like, I'm in, I'm notorious. Like people, I have infamy, but I'm not a celebrity. What I am known for is not something that I'm celebrated for. Right, and it's it's a weird thing because your your point in promo, being on podcasts or promoting yourself is to simply reclaim your name back. Yeah, and to show that I'm actually putting out good work into the world. Yeah, your podcast is fantastic. Thank you. Uh, I worked don't really tell me hard on Don't it. tell me the name. Don't tell me the name. I just I just subscribed today. Not limitations. Not hibernations. <laughs> not uh, salutations. <laughs> God damn it! What is what is the name of your podcast? Labyrinths. Labyrinths. Yeah, labyrinths. <laughs> think David Bowie. And you well, it's, well, it's funny. I listened to you on Rogan. I had notes. I listened to you on Rogan, and I was like, I could listen to her talk for fucking hours. You're very, very well spoken, meaning you put intent behind every word you say to come across and show a point. I don't always do that. And it's and it's it makes listening to you very easy Hmm. because there's not a lot of bullshit in between. I don't want to waste your time. Yeah. And you're very direct. Um, You're also very intelligent. You seem to have an angle on just about everything Joe would bring up. You had an you would you you could go back and forth with him on, you know, fucking universal income versus welfare versus Andrew Yang Mm -hmm. like just and then and and also to to make it clear like also I don't know is a very legitimate stand to take I think few like there is this sort of feeling that like saying I don't know or I don't know enough about this is not good enough like you don't actually have to have an opinion on everything I just happen to have an opinion on those things oh yeah well but I but and then I was like and then you were like, yeah, well, my podcast isn't, it, it's not necessarily like this. It's more scripted. And immediately I was like, that's not what I want to hear. I want to hear, <laughs> I want her hear her hang. And then I listened to it today and I was like, I was like, oh, this is a pretty good podcast. Thank you. It's, it's like an NPR podcast. Yeah. It yeah. It has a point. It has an angle. It's um, not like wandering, which is maybe the difference. That's what I do. Right. I, mine's wandering in circles sometimes. I think people could argue that sometimes they hear the same stories over and over. <laughs> This is clearly Listen, a sore point. No, I no, I I am. I, when I was first started this podcast, I was very, I was, I would listen to what people said, hmm. and then, and some of the notes were like, "Hey, man, you're clearing your teeth a lot." Like I go, "That's actually a legit. That's a legit response." Yeah, and I went, "Okay," because that kind of auditory stimulation can drive people nuts. Yep, and so I was like, "All right, I'll stop doing that." And then they're like, "Hey, man, the big one." The big one was you're not letting anyone talk. Mm. You're interviewing people, but you're not listening to them and you're talking over them. And when they start a story, you interrupt them to tell them. <laughs> and then like, a what's story that Instagram handle? Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. And so I I have tried my best to 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 eliminate that, but part of that is the what I feel like the people that listen I think they know it me so well now that they go, oh, of course he's going to tell her about the machine. Well, isn't there also a sort of comedian like improv part, like the yes and that you're mm-hmm. doing? Like you hear something somebody says and you're like, oh, I can add to that. Like it's, there's it that kind impulse. Of, yeah, but I don't know what I can add to your story. <laughs> Technically, I don't know what. I don't know. You almost got arrested because you robbed a train. Yeah, <laughs> That's yeah it's uh, yeah, it's it's interesting. But I but I I I. I feel like a podcast, it should be whatever you want it to be. My my wife, when she started hers, she was like very in very like, I want to get female um females that are married to comedians, wives of comedians. I want to bring them on. I want to talk to them. And I was like, I wouldn't corner yourself into one thing. That is very specific. Yes. Yeah, and, and or or a pot the a good friend of mine, Duncan Trussell's good friend of Joe's as well, um, said to me one time about letterman i idolized david letterman I, he's the greatest that ever did that genre in my opinion and and uh and i've done a bunch i did a lot a bunch of late night shows so i know i'm i just think he's the greatest but he said isn't it crazy that david letterman never got to change like he started with one format and then he had to do that same format for 20 years he goes a podcast can be whatever you want it to be yeah and i remember in that podcast with duncan i had a panic attack and i said um i think i'm having a panic attack and he said, mm-hmm. let's do a guided meditation. And he did a 15-minute guided meditation. That's lovely. On my podcast. And he goes, you couldn't do this on Letterman. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. And so I I started listening to your podcast. And I went, oh, okay, I like this. I was like, I like this. And they're not, it's just a little more thoughtful. Yes. And I, the, the point that I wanted to make with the podcast is that we all have felt lost at a certain point. And one of the challenges when you have, felt lost is telling that story to yourself about what happened like the processing of this thing that felt so overwhelming and that you had no control over Mm -hmm. is is a challenge not just to get through but also on the other end of it to process like what is the story that you then tell to yourself about that experience so that you can it doesn't feel like it's overwhelming to you, like especially trauma based ones. Like everyone has a different time that they felt lost and sometimes they're fun and sometimes it's traumatic. And especially with the traumatic ones, I feel like this, you, you lose your sense of self in the, in the process and to restore your sense of self, you need to find your voice, your perspective about what happened. And so I try to like, that's been sort of my ongoing struggle. And it's something that I feel like maybe I'm well equipped at to do and other people are less well equipped to do or i i just i guess a lot of people reach out to me and say i am going through some shit right now and i don't know how to feel about it and what to do about it and i feel trapped by it and it's like well you you can also have this sort of meta perspective of your own experience where you are looking down at the maze that you're stuck in and you can tell yourself a story about your own journey and that is how you get out so If I can help people find their voice and find their perspective about their experience by drawing upon my own sort of intuitive understanding based upon my experience, then that's a good thing. And it's also a worthwhile podcast to listen to. Yeah. I had, I I came out of, we were talking about that travel channel show I did and I came out of it with pretty intense PTSD Mm. because I was doing events that were overwhelming for me, Yeah, jumping out of planes and swimming oh, with gosh. sharks and and fucking just everything jumping off you know cliffs. just clock in clock out sharks i had a day in africa where i jumped off a stadium i swam with great white sharks and i repelled off table mountain all within a day i think you know what's like fucked up about that though what? like doing that over and over again one might call those peak experiences, right? Yeah. Peak experiences are not supposed to happen over and over and over again. Like peak experiences are peak because they are like a moment in your life that maybe you only have one peak experience of your life yeah. that you then sort of like have your whole sort of microcosm of your world. Like this is you and your experience and this is like a definitive moment for you and <laughs> yeah. it defines who you are. And if you are having peak experiences over and over and over again, what is your brain doing? Like, I am not surprised that you have PTSD because you have no time to process peak experiences, which are peak for a reason. They're like, they're tapping into your most base survival instincts. 
And you're just like, yeah, you know, another day at the office. Like, what? Yeah, I would have three a day. You're not do, supposed to do that. <laughs> I would, we would do three a day, and I would, I'd have them, and there would be two. It would be for two weeks, and then I'd be off for a week, and then we go back for two weeks. I did that for four years, and I, and then, and I just, I, I had a really hard time processing things, mm-hmm. and everything. My Leanne would be the better one to tell you this, but everything was at a level ten. Mm-hmm. Everything was at level ten. I couldn't. And I, and I needed all my experiences to be at a level 10. Mm-hmm. I still have a problem with that a little bit. Right now, I'm, I'm, uh, right now I'm going through that. Uh, I did, I had a really, really, really intense uh, th- four-week run on the road. And I lived in a tour bus, but it was like, I mean, just, you know, so I just started doing arenas. And, uh, and so i didn't realize i was doing arenas like i knew my buddy was doing arenas he was telling me I, i'm going out i'm doing arenas now i was like fucking badass i go out that's got to be awesome and then like, i got to green bay room? and i was like oh wait this is an arena and they're like yeah yeah you're doing a bunch of arenas now and i was like oh i didn't know i was doing i really didn't know i was doing arenas i don't really pay much attention to the size of the venue yeah. i just look at i look at the numbers and then i go what needs to be sold and i'll focus on that and i but i don't I don't think I, I don't think I was and then I, I did the first arena and like it was just it was oh an overwhelming experience and then yeah then I went to Florida State I had I mean I went to school at Florida State I, right, right when I left I was written up in Rolling Stone magazine as the number one party in the country and uh and I wasn't really I wasn't ceremony like they didn't celebrate my leaving the the school kind of hated me and they just oh. wanted me to get out oh. and so it kind of stunk my leaving kind of stunk and i felt like i didn't have a connection with the school anymore yeah um although i had the greatest time you could ever have in college i felt like i felt like i i it was soured by some teachers failed me in some classes because they felt like i had sullied the name of the school and they weren't did you do the work yeah i did the work and then i went in and i was like i was like well can i make up the work and this guy's like you can go fuck yourself how do you like that whoa I was a teacher and i was like i was like excuse me I was like, he's got to be joking. Can't right? get away with that anymore. Oh, no. <laughs> he was like, he was like, I'll tell you what, man. I spent my entire time getting my doctorate at this school, and you've just trashed the name of the school. He's like, I, my why, goal is. Why did you singularly trash the name of the school? You're a student. A pretty, was, I, whatever, I, who knows. It's a pretty big article. It was before fame was like a thing. Hmm. You know, it was like 1997. So, like, no, no one was famous. Like, now it's, I feel like everyone's famous, but like, it was a big deal and this guy literally told me to go fuck myself and then i'm sorry and told me no 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 i think you had dealt with worse stuff and so well yeah i can also be sorry yeah you can also be sorry i can accept that apology thank you no i can feel that i can feel that genuine uh and so i didn't have a connection i i felt i I was sour when i left also like i don't that bugs me out like he was still a professor who had a duty to you as a student i would like to get his name but you know what I don't need to. I, I would like to get his name, but I don't need to. He also had like a really weird version of you in his head. He didn't like me at all. He spent one class reading my article out loud in the class. Whoa. He sat everyone down and he, and he read the article and he picked apart the article and he deconstructed the article to my whole class. It was, a, it was a journal. It was a writing class. So I guess he felt, but he... That's he, weirdly aggressive to do to a student. It's very aggressive, and he kind of humiliated me throughout that entire class. And I, I was unaware, I was unaware that that would be something someone would do. So I kind of was like a good sport about it. Okay. And I figured if I threw a temper tantrum, I'm not going to look good in that. That sure. So I just kind of rolled with it, and I was like, yeah. I was like, yeah, you know, party, you know, whatever. Yeah. I just kind of maybe played into the character. So then when he failed me i was very shocked that i was like i was a good guy yeah i, I thought we shit. were on the same page i, all, like, all I humiliated me. i got humiliated we're on yeah we're cool and no. uh and then i left and, and then but then in coming back and I, I performed at florida state i performed i formed in the same place i saw nirvana play like i performed at the civic center and cool. there's an arena and it was i mean like that whole day was just processing emotion because like i went on i went on campus and people were coming up to me and they were like, uh, welcome back, birdie boy. And I was just like, I mean, sobbing, crying, Aww. walking around campus. And people, and I posted something on Instagram so everyone knew I was on campus. Yeah. So kids were coming out of their dorm rooms and trying to find me. And it was like the greatest. And then it ended with me. They gave me the spear that Chief Osceola throws into the center of the thing. And then I 
It was the fucking greatest day of my life. It was the greatest fucking day of my life. You pull, pull it. Can, let me just let me just show Amanda the greatest day of my life. Your acquittal from prison might have been pretty good, but <laughs> no. But that's no, that I'm actually joking, is joking. great because it it seems like they didn't. Like they saw you as a, the person. They saw me as the person I wanted. Yeah. I wanted them to see me as. They were yeah. proud of me. Yeah. The whole school was proud of me. Yeah. And I, it was like such a great. And they accepted great... you for who you were. So it sounds to me like your teacher was just completely missed the point of who you are and what you were hoping, what your dreams were. Oh, he didn't to be. give. He didn't give a shit about any part of me. And I think it's it, it. What what I'm. I was curious in the middle of telling you this. I was like, why am I telling her this? And I think I realized. It, it it's that same feeling you must have about those prosecutors and the people that did you wrong where you go i'm not who you thought i was mm -hmm. you're and projecting I need you, on and me. i need you to know who i am yeah and that was when i left florida state i was like i'm not an idiot who had bad intentions for this college yeah like i was a good i'm a good person yeah and uh and when i came back they treated me like they treated me like fucking florida state treated me like goddamn gold i've never I will always have a place in my heart for that school for as long as I live just because of how they were just so kind to me. Mm -hmm. every, every all the students, all the t everyone that saw me, it was fucking really fucking magical. And they accepted you for who you were. Yeah. So maybe if you can perform an arena in Italy. Okay. <laughs> On it. That's what's been holding me back. When do you think you'll when do you think you'll go back to Italy? So I have been back to Italy already once. Really? Um I did uh, I actually gave a talk there um so at, how famous are you in italy well how famous is oj simpson here in the u.s oh wow that's pretty crazy that's what they call me over there they, like, the o, they, they don't call me juice but they <laughs> they basically are like you're the oj simpson of italy you should do a rental car commercial oh god where i'm running in italy, in <laughs> italy and be like <laughs> hurts <laughs> no thank you no um i actually went um the Italy Innocence Project, which did not exist while I was um, still in prison, invited me to go and speak there for them to speak about trial by media. Um, and so I went, I kind of did what you're talking about. It wasn't an arena, but it was an auditorium and it was full of Italian people. Um, and How was your reception? Well, I was terrified going into it. I did not know. I like did not know if people were going to be throwing shit at me. Like I had no idea. But um, I went up there, I did my thing, I told my bit, um, and standing applause the entire, the entire auditorium. Um, I was, I, I, I had special protection while I was there because they, you know, they're paparazzi crazy and also like I had received death threats. So it was like a whole big thing. I had um, a personal guard sort of like take me off stage and down into the basement of this like big building where I was basically hiding out the entire time this conference was happening. And when I got down to the bottom, um, he like, I, I feel like I was like sort of deer in headlights from like the people standing up and applauding and I was whisked away. And then as soon as we got down to the bottom of the stairs in the basement, he gave me like a little squeeze and just said, perfetto. And I just started bawling. I was just I lost my mind because I was like, I didn't know if people would listen to me. Yeah. And a lot of people after that reached out to me and said, I'm sorry. So oh, not my prosecutor and not the police, but yeah. those people said they were sorry. And I really appreciated that. So I kind of did that. What I haven't done yet is a stand up comedy special. Is that, by the way. <laughs> I can, I can, I can definitely help you. I mean, I, I can definitely help you with your story. When I was 22 years old, I got accused of murder in Italy. Here's how it happened. Uh -huh. that's, that's how my story starts. When I was 22 yeah. years old, I got involved with the Russian mafia. Here's how it happened. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's um, did uh, did I'm curious how you met your husband and did he? Because he's here. He's a producer, Chris Robinson. Yes. God damn it, I'm good. I'm good. Awesome. What are the odds you thought I could pull that out of my ass? <laughs> Not at all. Um, I thought I know it because I was like, there's a, a that your name stuck because I Chris, the other Chris Robinson's Black Crows. Yeah. So I was like, I was like, ah, you've been getting Google alerts that tell you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I'm curious to how you met him and did he know about your story beforehand and how? Because I'll. 
when I met my wife, she didn't know that I was written up in Rolling Stone magazine. And one day we were in bed and she was like, hey, someone said you're like some party animal. And I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> it had been so long since that article came out. And I was like, no, so it was like five years. And I was like, oh, there's probably something I should let you read. And I gave her the article and we were in bed together. And she was like, oh, my God. <laughs> I mean, this article is like, I took a shit on a pizza box to win an election. It just doesn't doesn't paint me as like, you can read it, but it's not who I am. But it is definitely who I am. And okay. so And so she was like, oh i was like does this change anything she was like no nah, i don't think so she was like I, I pretty much know who you are yeah i met i already know you yeah, yeah. but did, how did that happen with you and your husband um so i was writing for a local newspaper um doing like um at first i was writing under a pseudonym and i was doing arts correspondence so i was like going to plays <laughs> what was your pseudonym it was emil monte emil monte mm-hmm um emil is the name of my, yeah emil's the name of a character in a book that my grandma liked as a kid and um monte was like a, a can of del monte peas that were on the counter at the time that i was trying Very to come smart. up with the name um anyway so i was writing under pseudonym but i had actually just started writing under my actual name right before i got an assignment to read and review a novel by a local like a debut novel by a local artist which was him I didn't know who he was. I had no idea. I was just given a copy of his book and asked to review it for the paper. And the name of this book is? War of the Encyclopedists. And it's about? It's um, about two best friends, um, one of whom gets deployed in I Afghanistan or Iraq, Iraq, and the other is deployed to uh, poetry school. And um, they stay in touch by writing this Wikipedia page to each other about each other. Meanwhile, they have um, weird thruple, quadruple situations. Hilarity ensues. Yeah. The opening scene is um, them going to like an arts costume party where one of them is dressed as um, he's on a date with someone who's dressed as sexy Osama bin Laden. Um, anyway, it's, it's, yeah. it's a funny book. It's It's funny and it's moving. Like it has a really cool, there's a, artist person who has like an abortion um and her like depicting like she there's this drawing that she does as she sort of feels this like thing inside of her unraveling um anyway it's a it's yeah. a good book um i wrote a rave review about it really? and i like to say that i wasn't sleeping with him until after i read his book <laughs> so um but yeah, I didn't know who he was. I wasn't ever planning on meeting him. I just wrote and reviewed a book, uh, reviewed his book. And then the day after I- Under the name of Amanda Knox was Yes, told. under the name Amanda Knox was like one of the first articles that I was writing under my actual name. And I reviewed it, submitted it. And the day after I submitted it, I walked out of my apartment building and I noticed that there was a flyer up in like the diner window across the street. And it was for a book reading of his book. And I was like, oh shit. I never go out. I never go see anybody. I never do anything. Maybe I should just go to my local bookstore and check out this book reading for this book that I just read. Sounds kind of fun. I'm just going to like duck in and try to be invisible. And of course it was, um, I, I ducked in and I was not invisible. Um, but I got to see him do his reading. And afterwards I asked him for an interview um, and it was him and his best friend. They wrote a book together. I thought that was really interesting. So I, um, I went and hung out with them. We drank scotch, watched Star Trek, chatted. Um, and at the end of the interview, he just shook my hand and said, we should be friends. And I was like, oh, I can make friends with people. Like this was very shortly after I was fully exonerated and I was no longer being hunted down by the Italian justice system. And I was like, huh i can grow roots i can like be friends with people like a normal person wow so he was one of the first friends that i made since being fully exonerated and we didn't start dating until like nine months later but that was great because he didn't know much about my case he actually he had he had heard about it like he knew that it was a case um but he thought it had something to do with defenestration like someone being pushed out of a window he had no idea that it was, you know, what it was. I heard the same story, but the hook was on his hand, foot. Do you ever, I've, I've, that's a joke I've been saying my entire life. Is it's, it's from Meatballs. I don't know. Meatballs is a Bill Murray movie, and he tells the story about the guy, and and the whole time he's got a hook in his shirt, and he just comes out and he goes, 
He goes, and then he had a hook. And they go, whoa. And they all start walking away. And I think Spaz, one of the guys goes, I heard the same story, but the hook was on his foot. <laughs> and it, so it's. So it's like him, it's, it's a reference of him going, oh, yeah, yeah, I heard your story. The guy, they threw some people out a window. And you're yeah, like, not no, the same story at all. No, yeah. no. <laughs> yeah. He looks a lot like my one of my best friends. Yeah? Yeah, Miles Mosley. Yeah. Is that a comedian? No, no. It's a guy, guy that was just one of the best dudes in the world. So Chris did stand up. What? No way. Did, I've got some open mics. Hmm. Never been able to like, pursue it. Well, you're in Seattle. Seattle's got a great scene. Yeah, we've yeah. had a good time. Yeah. yeah. I like seeing him tell jokes. So then so then was there a breakdown night where you're like, all right, we should go to dinner. We should probably talk about this whole thing. Honestly, no. Um, he started dating me before he even read my book. Um I mean, was that like did people know about you? By the way, you have the best goddamn baby in the world. <laughs> this yeah, is she's fucking so this baby chill. is like silent. <laughs> This was she's, not Georgia, and this was not Isla. <laughs> she's the best, actually. She's. <laughs> she we've already be. taken her on one trip, and she like did not ever fuss at all. She's the best. The main thing is I didn't do the fussing. Yeah, you did. Yes. Yeah. So the the really important thing that Chris did when he met me is he didn't Google me. He just wanted to meet me and be around me. As did my you, own person. Did you, were your buddies like, bro? You know who she is, right? And yeah. you're just like, hang mm -hmm. on, I'm, I'm I like her. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, like what do you think did, did she, she did, that's yeah. always his first question and i was like fuck that question i don't i don't want to look at her through that lens of this whole culture yeah so he didn't and then eventually the tabloids found out about him and started calling him my boy toy and like horrible stuff people photoshopped knives into pictures of him and like people made comments about how he must be a freak who was in love with like a psychopath or whatever and he eventually read my book um i think he read it uh, it was shortly before the netflix documentary came out um because the netflix documentary is coming out and it was gonna be bringing that whole experience up of, in my life again um so he wanted to be knowledgeable of it and then he's had like this whole journey of like accepting not accepting the fact that like people irrationally hate me um he struggles with it way more than i do at this point um i think because and he's really like one of the main reasons why i'm even sitting here in front of you today because when he met me i was in hiding i was not i was not i was not in the world and um he was one of the people who sort of convinced me that I not only deserved to be in the world like a normal person, but like the world didn't even deserve me is basically his perspective. So like, Gosh. um, Chris Robinson so, hitting dingers over here. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah, no, he's, he's, does he say stuff like you're sitting on the couch? He's like, come on, don't stay on the couch. It's like being in prison. Let's go do stuff. And you go, Oh, he's uh, constantly saying things to me. Like, I wish that you, believed in yourself and that you didn't let all of the horrible stuff that happened to you like like bring you down and like yeah. you you deserve so much better and um and i wish she was as proud of herself as i am of her i mean she's not you know she, she doesn't have a she doesn't love herself as much as i love her right she doesn't yeah. see she's not inspired by her <laughs> which is like probably a good thing but yeah i love myself way more than my wife would ever love me <laughs> I love myself so much. You have no idea. <laughs> I'm fucking at me. Uh, this is just you know a room what? celebrating it's pretty me. Great. Who is your artist, by the way? I Brett love Brett Brock. It's so good. Like, yeah, Brett he's Brock. So good at being like the expressions are fabulous. I want to like see if he'll do us a, a family portrait for us. Uh, <laughs> yes, I can make that happen. I'm gonna text him right now. He uh he probably doesn't know this is my phone number. I'd call him. Hey, it's Bert. New phone. <laughs> Period. Can you do a family <laughs> portrait for Amanda Knox and draw it? He's gonna get. He's gonna fucking love this. He's a really talented guy, and he was he was a fucking home run for me. This is this this wall m m reminds me of when I took control of my career. I mean, it's gorgeous. 
I and love his there some of these drawings I, so I absolutely can love. I ask like how the vision for these drawings happened like did you yeah. have a vision and then he like brought it to life or did he like just say I have a vision you're gonna be in a school uniform wearing roller skates so I'll show you and you're gonna love it so um he would go I wish I could get more of them because yeah you could see exactly um so okay you ready Yes. So where's my Philly one? See this one right here? Yes. So this is a story I told. Um, There's a story I told about um, Ralph Sampson. Ralph Sampson uh, is a professional basketball player okay. who hazed me when I was a child. Um, yeah. I, I, I wonder how much trauma I fucking have pent up. Anyway. I mean, <laughs> you keep saying things that. And so make I said, like I said, people are mean to you. I wrote to him. <laughs> um, Oh shit, I just Oh wow, him. cool. He's great. But I said to him, Hey, uh, can you send me I wanna do one for I wanna do one for Philly. So he sends me like these rough sketches. Oh yeah. And then and then I go, Yeah, but I want it to kind of look like this. Okay. I want it to look like this. So then he mashes them up and he has me standing like that. And that then is has Ralph dope. Has them behind me. So it was it was really fun. It was a lot of fun. So like I text him and I go, Hey, Sober October was the, that's my favorite poster right there. And I said, um, Hey, was our first Sober October? Can you make me and Tom look like the Blues Brothers? And he was like, Well, shouldn't I put Ari and Joe in it? And I was like, Oh, yeah. I was like, Yeah, put Ari as, as, uh, as what's her name? Margot, whoever the fuck was the female in that. Right, I think right. it was, it was Princess Leia. Yeah. Um, I don't know famous I, people's I, names. I'm, so I'm, sorry. I'm just in a movie with Mark Hamill. I should know her name um for carrie, carrie fisher. fisher and he's like and i'll make joe as james brown and i was like oh great or we did the facts of life or I'd, I'd or i'd say like hey man i'm gonna be in um hawaii can you have me riding get, just put me riding a shark or something okay and, and this one this is our family portrait Aww. this is my favorite that's me Aww, priscilla that's sweet. Leanne, georgia and isla and i was like but it was really fun it was really really fun because i was just claiming my career like i was just taking control of it where i was like if I promote a little bit, uh, then I can, then I won't come home from a city and people go, when are you going to be in Chicago? If I just a little bit of extra work and I'll put it on Instagram, I'll, I'll get the thing. I'll say, this is a poster for Chicago. Um, I'll be selling these at the show. And uh, it was great. Now, now I'm, things are a little past this for me in that I have now have one tour poster. It probably is over there somewhere. I have one tour poster for the whole tour. And, okay. And, uh. But these, this was a really fun period of my life. So I, I do they put, all reference jokes that you've made? Uh, some. This is Tampa. I just wanted to look like Bruce the Buccaneer. Okay. Um, uh, some there was a period of time where me and this guy Tom Segura were fat shaming each other. Okay. So anytime I could put uh, Tom in a video and make him look fat, or like I was going to Cleveland and I had uh, their quarterback from the time was was partying and I had a picture of me out partying him, Johnny Manziel and uh you have this what's up with the like red speedo does this really I wear exist? speedos a lot I, I wear speedos okay. a lot i see i have a problem with clothes i think it's because i grew up in florida um fair but i and i i grew up in wearing just speedos up until i was like in fucking like a little too i grew old. up in seattle we have a birkenstocks problem uh, i was a big birkenstocks <laughs> i'm a big flip-flop guy like i have my own line of flip-flops yeah they're really fucking comfortable and uh but uh do you have like a callus between your two front no, toes? No, I'm sure I do somewhat, but not not, not that I'd okay. notice. Did you get any scars while you were in prison? Scars? Well, um, I have, let's see. I wasn't, so I never got like beaten up in prison. Just like little scars, like just cut your foot and you're like, oh shit. Like I have a scar on my foot right here that I, I remember where I was when I got, every time I see that scar, mm. I remember that night. My hmm. buddy's Croy's house, and, my, and his mom was trying to get it to stop bleeding. But I'd been drinking all day, and we couldn't get it to stop bleeding. And then I went into the doctor the next day, and I was, it was the first time I was told I had high blood pressure. And I was like, oh, that's impossible. I don't have high blood pressure. But I, hmm. every time I see that scar, I think about that. Any scar. Like, now I have a big scar on my elbow and I because hmm. I had surgery. Do uh, emotional scars count? <laughs> there th- there are just certain things that I'll never forget. Like, what's something you run into? And I'll wrap this up. I, your baby's been too perfect. Like, I, <laughs> I, 
<laughs> um, what's something you, that, that creeps up on you? Um, like where you like a smell or something where it just takes mm. you back to that. Actually, there's a, I have a good story about this. Um, so I didn't spend that much time in Italy, um, not in prison. Spent the yeah. vast majority of my time in Italy in prison. Very and few people do that. Keep going. Yes. Um, I don't recommend it. Um, it was so I basically became fluent in Italian in prison. I was not fluent in Italian before. So there are certain things that I learned in wait, 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 prison. Wait, I hate to do this. Yes. I interrupt you. Please. So is that like if an Italian person came to America and learned English in prison, he'd be like, so you what's up, motherfucker? Yeah. And for yeah. real? Yes, absolutely. Ah! So there, <laughs> there were certain there. terms that I thought were just the normal terms that oh. the priest had to continually um, tell me were not the correct terms. Um, like I kept referring like, um, so uh, sedia is, is the word for chair. It's um, very similar to the word sedere, um, which means to sit or like your sedere is your butt. Yeah. Um, but I only ever learned the term culo, which is like the, the ass. And I was just like throwing out like, oh, let me just sit my ass over here. Like, <laughs> and my priest was just like, what are you saying? Like, you're a good little girl. Like, why are you using these terms? Anyway, so, but the better one, was when I finally got out of prison, I went, um, I was invited of all things to um, the Seattle International Film Festival mm -hmm. um, by like a local person. And um, they were showing an Italian film that was with um, Napolitano dialect. Um, and I had only, only ever heard Napolitano dialect in prison. So immediately going into this film, I was like, oh, this will be interesting. I'll just watch this Italian film, see how it goes. And it, the the di the way that people were speaking to each other immediately brought me back into prison and i had there was one moment where someone went up to a window and called out a facciati which in italian it means it, we don't really have a word for this in english but it's bring your face to it so like come to the window basically and i had only ever heard that term in reference to the prison bars. People telling me, come to the prison bars, I have to talk to you. Like you're in your cell, the guards are outside of the cell, they're like, oi, a facciati. And so that, I did not have a good relationship with the bars of my cell. Like I, I almost always refused to ever even look at them because they made me feel claustrophobic. And so I did not like the, the experience of like having to come up to them and like look through the little slit and like, it just bothered me. And so as soon as I heard the person in this film say, oh, facciati, I um, I started hyperventilating and I had a panic oh, attack and boy. I had to leave the movie theater um, because I was just not, I was not ready for that. Um, so that's one of those things. Jesus. Good God. That, uh, yeah, that when things, cre when you, I always say the thing that makes me cry isn't the thing you think it'll be. Mm. It's like, uh, I was, I'm trying to think of a right way to say this on stage, but when we put our dog Priscilla down, I'm, I'm telling this mm. bit on stage. It wasn't It wasn't until like she shit on the couch and the guy was like, oh, your dog shit on the couch. And I went to defend her and I was like, mm. it's okay, baby. Yeah. And that's the thing. When I, when I said it's okay, baby, and I realized, oh, she's not here anymore. Oh. Like, oh, fucking broke me. And then, so like all those, those, those weird side things that fucking flip you out where you're like, I didn't expect that to happen yeah um but uh but i i feel like i've covered everything correct is there anything i, mean, I haven't was there any <laughs> i mean there are whole worlds inside this person well but. i'll tell you what i i i i, I, I had a i from I, I followed you from when this case started not started started but at, when it was in the news um i remember first learning about you and i followed it well enough to be one of right when the doc the netflix documentary came out i watched that and to see you on rogan you were great on rogan i didn't see you on whitney but when i saw you on whitney i went oh i remember being so happy for you because i was like oh this is she's getting out there like she's yeah. reclaiming her life she is not going to just disappear and i think I, I think i followed i heard you talk at times about what your life was like back in seattle 
And when I saw you on Rogan, I just absolutely fucking fell in love with you. I was like, she is so fucking, she's, you were so good on that. I think we, I said that to Joe. Yeah. I, you were I, fantastic yeah. on that podcast. You were very, you're just a great speaker. And, oh. and, uh, and I'm, uh, I feel very privileged to have had you on my podcast. So thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Yeah. No, I appreciate it. Oh, it's been really and nice to meet just, you. And I'll, I'll, thank uh, you, uh, Whitney, for this yeah. delicious June shine. And all you got to do now is see the machine story, and then uh, yeah. that's it. <laughs> Deal. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. I need to learn how to do punchlines out of tragedy. That's something I would love oh, to get <laughs> feedback on. I, I'm working on it right now. I'll tell you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Oh,